I, I appreciate you not using that opportunity to squeeze another ass joke in there. <laughs> I did. I don't <laughs> it. Men riding their asses. <laughs> they do bad as I don't know why it's taken us so long to think to invite Christopher on a podcast because we've spoken about him and his book and his influence for years. Um, if you don't know why he's on here, what the hell are you doing listening to our podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. Welcome on the podcast, Christopher McDougall. How are you doing? I'm actually a little bit disappointed because I think we just left our best material on the cutting room floor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the shitty, the shitty river ultra marathon is now known only amongst us. <laughs> We're all going to do it. We're all going to do it. We'll see you yeah. in Birmingham. <laughs> Well, um, we're assuming anyone listening to this episode has already read your book, has got an understanding of what it's about, all of that, um, your, your, your biggest book. So what we'd really like to do today is talk about the build up to that, the fallout for that, and then the other books as well. Um, yeah. So if this takes us four to five hours, <laughs> <laughs> it may just have to take that long. Um, but yeah, do you want to tell us about what, Tell us about yourself as a, as a runner, as a journalist, before um, before Born to Run came out. You know, it's funny because at this moment, I'm having this really weird deja vu experience because I'm writing a kind of a companion book for Born to Run. And right. the opening chapter is kind of a, a summation of what led me down that path in the first place. So I'm going back through it because... It was 2004 when this whole adventure first began. So now it's with that 16 years ago. So I'm refreshing my memory and I'm reviving these old conversations I had with Caballo Blanco and Eric Gordon for the first time. And I haven't reread the book myself in, you know, 15 years. And now I'm talking about it with you guys too. So it's just so bizarre to be <laughs> kind of live, reliving the stuff in my head, you know, and talking about it again. Uh, but yeah, so the situation was, Essentially, I was not a runner. You know, I was a um, kind of retired basketball player slash rower who was getting heavy and out of shape and thought, okay, well, I better run a little bit. And every time I tried, I, I got, got injured, you know. Something always, like, went south fast, you know, mm. hamstrings, Achilles. Well, before we go any further, rower stroke basketball player, how, how, <laughs> how does that cross over? Like, where, where, where do you go, oh, do you know what, I'm just going to go shoot a few hoops. Actually, I'm going to get in a boat as well. How, how does what that kind of ghetto over? public school did you go to? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing about it is it's a, very, it's a very unusual story, and I almost don't want to answer it because it's its own, like, narrative. But what happened was this, was I grew up in, in Philadelphia, which is like a basketball city. You know, this is back in the 70s, 80s. All basketball all the time. We've heard the Will Smith rap. We, uh, yeah, we, we know, know, we know, we know. We know. Hey, look, you know what? I'll drop my <laughs> my Will Smith, the Smith thing. Like, yeah, we grew up in Overbrook, right near Will Smith's house. So, yeah, that was it, man. Everyone played ball. Um, if you didn't get a chance to go to Bel Air and be a prince, you know, you kept on playing ball in the city. <laughs> and I, I was a big guy. I was, you know, six foot four, like two meters tall and heavy. So, um, I played ball. But then a weird thing happened was my last year in high school. My basketball, you know, playing is coming to an end. I'm hoping that maybe some college will bring me on board. And this guy walks into the gym, and he starts calling over all the guys who are over six feet tall. And uh, his name was Chuck Crawford. And he said, you know, Philadelphia has this amazing tradition of competitive rowing. And we're like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'd never seen anybody rowing before. But it turns out back in, like, the 40s and 50s, there had been a lot of rowing in Philadelphia on the Schuylkill River. So those boathouses were the places we went to to drink and smoke weed. We did not know it was taking <laughs> boats out. So this guy made it his mission to revive like the 1950s tradition of uh, scholastic rowing in Philadelphia. The basketball players, it's like, it's like he was asking us to like donate a liver to him. Like we have no <laughs> But the thing about it was, like, my basketball season ended. I wasn't getting any offers from colleges. I had nothing else to do. Uh, some of my buddies on the football team decided to try rowing. I wandered down there, the only guy from the basketball team that tried it. And lo and behold, it turns out, I've always been a very mediocre basketball player. But it turns out, just genetically, 
I am like a fucking Wolverine of rowing. Like I, I'm <laughs> a genetic mutation designed for this sport. I'm like the perfect build for it. So I, you know, I, I drop into a boat and that boat ended up winning the national championship. My first Whoa. three months of ever trying the sport. And then I started getting recruited by universities for rowing. And so, but I was one of these guys that like, you guys ever see um, Happy Gilmore? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Love I'm, I'm, a, I'm like the Happy Gilmore of rowing. Like, I'm a hockey player, you know? No, dude, you're not. You're a golfer. So, I'm a basketball <laughs> player. You're really a shitty basketball player, but you're a gifted rower. And so, that was it. So, I ended up at university, and I rowed at a really uh, competitive level, like a national team level uh, university for four years. Super hard, 365 days a year, double sessions. And then when, when that ends, you know, university ends, and now suddenly you're not working out four hours a day, and then your body just, like, goes to hell. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was trying to do with, with running. I was like, all right, I just got to, you know, knock off these extra, like, you know, three stone that I put on in the past six months. And that's what I was doing. That, that was, like, the extent of my running. But I don't know if, if you guys have this experience. I mean, you guys have a lot of – History with running injuries? Yeah, yeah I, got recently. A, um, I got a, a, a terrible ca- case of plantar fasciitis after reading a certain book and going out running uh, straight <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Which book, mine? <laughs> of course. Did, I switched to have... four for running, tore my hamstring. <laughs> yeah. That was about 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, every copy of Born to Run comes with a waiver, by the way. I'm not sure if you guys <laughs> The, this is the real reason you're on. This is your what do you what do you, what do they call it in the state? This is your subpoena. You've been yeah. served. <laughs> no, you're being <laughs> you yeah. Exactly. I think this is arbitration right now. <laughs> We're not really a podcast. We're just a law firm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do actually think that there was a question from someone that said, "How many?" How many injuries do you personally think you you know, you are responsible for for people people you know having taken taken you know been inspired by the book and then gone out and just got, gone crazy? Well, you know it's funny because I just watched that Beatles documentary on uh, wherever it was uh, the Peter Jackson Beatles documentary. Yeah. And, and my takeaway from it was what you notice in that is no matter what's going on, Paul's in a good mood. No matter what. He's hungover. He's in a good mood. You know, George's pissed off. Paul's okay with it. You know, Yoko is sitting on his fucking amp. Paul's okay. Yeah. And so my, my new resolution in life was like, you know, be Paul. Just like be okay with everything. But that's the thing that kind of gets under my skin a little bit because, you know, we've been sold such a bill of goods by the running shoe companies. Like, yeah, God, I got to have cushioning. You got to have motion control. got to have art support. And then people like decide to experiment because of born to run and take away the shoes and then and then their ankles hurt. Like, well, dude, it's not my fault that you know you sat in the sofa you know, metaphorically for 30 years. You know, the, the shoes, the cushioning and the arch support, all that motion control, you strip it away, you're not gonna miraculously be like bulletproof. It's gonna take a period of adjustment. But we live in this kind of mindset of like nothing is slow, nothing's gradual, it's gotta be, you know. Zero to 60 miles an hour. So that is my very unpaul like way of saying that, uh, yeah, I mean, you try something new. You go to the gym for the first time. You bench press, press 200 pounds. You're going to get hurt. You know, you got to take it gradual. And, and most people don't do that. Yeah, I mean, that that's certainly true. Um, so, so going in, how did you chance across this topic then of the, the Born to Run? How did When did that first form in your mind as being – worthy of the book. I'm just thinking how self-defensive my last answer was. Like, <laughs> I'm this guy, I'm like you know what? This guy should be doing a deposition. Um, <laughs> yeah, so what, what happened was, so I'd worked as a foreign correspondent uh, for the Associated Press for a bunch of years as a news reporter. And then I left that to start doing magazine freelance work. And so when you're doing that, your mind, you know, your, your radar is constantly up. You know, you're, you're mm. rabid all the time for something that sounds weird. And I heard about these guys, you know, down in Mexico who were running these extreme distances in sandals. And I thought, this, this kind of doesn't add up. You know, like how they run in sandals. Again, back at that time, ultramarathoning was pretty niche. Like you didn't hear mm. about it very much. 
And the idea of anybody running 100 miles just sounded impossible, you know? Like, the, the marathon was the ultimate challenge. Like, how are these dudes doing five marathons? It's impossible. And so that, that's what I became interested in. I thought I'll just go down there, do a nice little article for Runner's World about these quirky guys in their sandals. But what really changed everything was when I get down to the Copper Canyons, I finally locate the uh, Varamuri tribe. They're not very welcoming because, you know, why would they be? Um, they've been like dodging invaders for 400 years and now here I show up. But then I meet this guy named Caballo Blanco, like the white horse. And he is a fellow gringo who's been living down there for 15 years. And the weird coincidence was that he was like almost exactly like my height and my build and we had the same shoe size. And uh, he said that, yeah, he'd been injured a lot as a runner, moved down there specifically to learn how to run like the Varamori, and it changed everything. 15 years later, he's like rambling around on these 100 mile runs. So that was the first time it ever dawned on me that running was a craft. You know, you don't just strap on your cushion shoes and just go for it. You actually have to learn the skill, like everything else. You learn to ski or bowl or uh, dance. You you learn the steps. Martial arts, you learn it gradually. And it's the first time anybody ever said, yeah, dude, running is a craft that you have to learn. And once you do, then you're free for life. And did you, when you, when you like, you know, met the, um, the, the Taramar and you you saw what was going on and, and Kamala Blanco, did it? Did you already have things in your mind about where this could go, or or was that kind of like the starting point? And then you started thinking about how do I layer um, other stories on top of it. I'm just curious about how, because you you bring so many different elements um, into into kind of like you know the, the, the central narrative of the book. Um, it, it's just interesting to find how 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 do you piece those things together? You start with the kind of like the with the with this this element of curiosity. And then where, how do you know where to go from there? there well, two, there are two things at work. One was, um, no, I, I didn't realize any of this stuff was there. I thought this would be a very quick, easy assignment. Get out of Mexico. Oh, look at these, you know, curious people. Have a little adventure. And that's the article. But then I meet this guy named Caballo Blanco. And there's his, his whole story. And then he tells me about the Leadville Trail 100, where the Raramori first showed up and began to dominate. And then there's a curious fact about that race, which is that in ultramarathons, women are on an almost equal footing with the men. You know, and that is unique to ultramarathons. So what's that all about? And mm -hmm. every layer of the onion just kept revealing something else and something else. So what I tried to do in the book was relate it the way I discovered it. So as I learn a new thing, it goes into the book. And then the next thing, the next thing. So I'm, I'm almost kind of relating it chronologically the way it appeared to me. So first, yeah. oh, there's this tribe. Oh, there's this dude. Oh, there was this race. Oh, what's the story with the women? Well, what's the story with the shoes? And then add it bit by bit by bit. And then each new person who entered it, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, Barefoot Ted arrives on the scene and there's his whole like wacky adventure. And then here comes Jen and Billy and who are they all about? So that was basically it. It, it became, first, uh, experientially, it was kind of a, a, a wild roller coaster. But then trying to like stuff all this stuff into the suitcase, you know, like how do you get all those 57 pairs of underwear into the suitcase? Like how do you lay it so it make it so it all fits? That that was a real challenge. And were you nervous when you when you started to well, you realized you were gonna have a big call out of the brand and actually what you were saying was pretty controversial, hadn't really been said before. You know, it's funny. So I went through a couple of evolutions. Um, at first, I was a little concerned. I thought, oh, you know, because there, again, there's no science behind this. There was no science behind this. It was mm. a very strong supposition by a lot of people. But what, what was curious about the, the running magazine, and they were just as guilty, even more so, the running magazines and the running shoe stores are really more culpable even than the stores, uh, than, sorry, than the manufacturers, because it, Curious thing about the running um, shoe manufacturers, like they never promise anything, you know? Mm. Nike never says this shoe's gonna do anything. They just put it on the yeah. shelf. It's motion control, it's stability, that's all. It's when you go to the running shoe store or the magazines that tell you, oh, well, if you supinate, you need this shoe. You know, if you overpronate, you need that shoe. 
Um, but the shoe companies themselves never make any claims. And that, that's where Vibram got itself in trouble. You know, Vibram was a company mm -hmm. of true believers, and they're like, these shoes will reduce injuries. <laughs> and class action lawyers like, really? <laughs> You can't prove it, and, and they got nailed for it. But what's curious about the shoe companies is that they've really put the burden of proof on our own biological makeup. You know, they basically say, well, you have to prove that bare feet are better. Like, I don't have to prove anything. You know, like, I was born with these feet. You should prove that your shoes are any better, you know? You're telling me to buy them. Why? What are, exactly are they supposed to do? So when I... When I went into working on this book, it seemed to me that the whole balance of power had shifted. You know, it should be up to the shoe companies to defend mm. what they're telling you. But that wasn't out there. There was no science and nobody was investing any money in proving that bare feet are better, you know? So, but then the second thing happened was, so as I'm working on the book, it was about two years of research and writing to do the book. But towards the end of that two years, I had spent so much time in the orbit of people like Barefoot Ted and Barefoot Ken Bob, that the whole minimalist running thing was kind of old to me by that point. Like you get so immersed in that world, you assume that, that world is the entire universe. Mm -hmm. And I thought, ah, well, you know, everybody already knows this stuff by now. So I almost cut the entire chapter on running shoes because I thought, ah, you know, everybody knows this is boring. And it's the only, it's the only chapter where the narrative uh, comes to a screeching halt. Yeah. Because anything else, it's story, yeah. story, story. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, let me let me just take 30 pages and talk to you about footwear. And, uh, and then we'll start the story again. And I kept looking at that chapter thinking, I don't know, man. It's kind of it's kind of boring. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I should cut it. And then I thought, eh, just in case, I'll just leave it in there. And then lo and behold, that became like the big sort of detonating point of the whole book. When when you were you know, obviously uh, having conversations about this and getting into it, did was, did anyone come and whisper in your ear and say, I don't, I don't think you should do this? Or were, were there any kind of murmurings yeah. or anything else? Any kind of like, red dots if, on if your you, forehead you as you're writing? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I, I really learned, uh, I learned a lot of lessons from that experience because, again, because I thought this was going to be a boring chapter, I thought, okay, I better come out of the mm. game just roaring. And so I, I, I think the first sentence of it's along the lines of like, you know, I think the sentence was something along the lines of like, you know, it's so easy to blame everything on Nike for running injuries, but that's okay because it, it is their fault. <laughs> I thought I, I kept waiting for my publisher's attorneys to say, "Dude, no way, no way, you'll end up with concrete boots in a river." Um, but they never pushed back on it at all. They said, "Okay, that that's you know protected speech. You're good to go." And then once they gave me the go ahead for that first sentence, like I literally laid the blame for running injuries at the feet of Bill Bowerman. Uh, and then I just kept on going. So the rest of the chapter is pretty, you know, pretty bare knuckles. But it was vetted by attorneys, everything was cool. But then I was bracing myself. I thought, wait, I was waiting for like the, <laughs> the Southeast and they never said a word. And it really taught me a lesson, which was that, you know, you know, ASICs and Adidas, they're not in the business of arguing with like mouthy writers. They don't give a shit. Yeah. If people, want minimal, if people want minimalist shoes, they'll sell minimalist shoes. They want hokas, they'll sell hokas. So they're not going to argue with me. If I write a book and people get excited about minimalist shoes, then they'll just pivot and make minimalist shoes. Do we people... see how far we can take that? Nike kill babies to make <laughs> sweatbands, kill them. Well, yeah, I mean, someone argue, you're right. Someone would argue, <laughs> someone argue that in um, their Asian factories, they might be doing exactly that, but. You know, wow. So they never, you've never received any kind of feedback or have you ever run into, have you ever been in a running convention or at anywhere where suddenly one of the VPs of Nike's there or just even a, an off the mark, off the, you know, off, off the cuff comment or anything like that? Uh, well, I had a very curious um, experience. So no, I, I've never been in those circles. Um, I've never been in those circles around running store people or, or sort of, Running shoe stores, yeah, they kind of froze me out. Um, they, they wanted nothing to do with the book the first year or so. So nothing from the running industry at all. I was invited to nothing. Mm -hmm. No one ever talked about the book. Runners, Runners World Magazine ignored the book. Even when it was like the number Runners two. Runners World Magazine did. Wow. What did they say? How did they explain that? Nothing. No, you know, nothing. Uh, 
I had stopped writing for them a couple years earlier. The book came out. It was like, I think the number two or three bestseller in the United States. It dominated for three years. <laughs> and Runner's World never reviewed it, never mentioned it, never wrote about it. It's as if it didn't exist. So, like, Runner's World like that with us. They won't acknowledge our. <laughs> oh, is, that, is that right? They know what the, 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 yeah. the bad boys, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I remember though, but they were. But the thing is, they were brief because at that, at that time I was a, um, a journalist for Men's Running. We were invited over to um, Paris Marathon by ASICS, and um, I, I remember sitting there while they were properly doing a hatchet job on on the, the idea of barefoot running. Like to all us journalists and talking about it and you know kind of like going on and on and on about it and so you know although they might not have been kind of like publicly doing it they were kind of doing it at some level. Well, they would do articles like for instance, you know, Runners World will do an article about you know minimalist running is it good for you or not and they would just you know just rip it apart. So there's lots of articles uh, indirectly attacking um, the, the the mindset of Born to Run, yeah. but the book itself. They ignored it. But I did have one weird experience was that um, Vibram Five Fingers was doing a display at the outdoor retailers convention in Salt Lake City. And this was about, I don't know, seven or eight months after the book came out. And so I go there and they were basically giving away a free copy of the book to anybody who stopped by their booth. And this guy walks up to me, this craggy old dude, looked like he stepped off like a, a horse in the middle of like a John Wayne movie. And he comes up and his name is Hawk Harper. I'm like, oh, dude, you're just right out of the old west. Hawk Harper. And he goes, I own a running shoe store in Orem, Utah. And what you're talking about, I've been doing that for 30 years. I'll take a pair of New Balance, and I'll take a Sawzall, and I would just cut the heel right off that, that, that New Balance because they were too goddamn big, you know, too big. <laughs> so this guy, and it turns out he was an extremely influential running sh um, shoe guy in, in Utah. Does that mean and when you walked in his shop, it was just like stacks and stacks of shoes with no heels? You kind of went in there and you'd be like, right, <laughs> what, what am I paying for here? <laughs> exactly, right. I just pay him for the laces. Uh, and there's another guy named Kurt Munson who had another big run issue store in Michigan. And it turns out the manufacturers actually listen to these guys. Uh, there, there are certain people around who have big stores and they're known as like influencers. And, and they'll actually ask these guys what's going on. So Kurt Munson in Michigan and, and Hawk Harper in Utah, both invited me out to their stores to actually talk to their customers. And you know, Hawk wasn't doing it with all of his shoes, but some mm. of them he thought the heels were too built up, he was sawing them up. So his son, Golden Harper, was the guy who created Ultra, um, the Ultra Zero Drop running shoes. Th that's his no son. Way. Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. Because, and and did, you, did you get the sense or any feedback that the waves that you made the shoe companies were getting nervous or or Nike and added that because they a lot of them went a lot of them brought out products that were low drop almost immediately as if that you know they're like right we're on it but did you sense anything or hear anything well no I mean think about it was Nike had the Nike free before Born to Run came out so part of what I was looking at in my book is like wait a minute they must know this stuff because they're, they've already created a shoe. You know, the Nike Free is exactly that. And my takeaway was they all know this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, no, I'm no fucking genius that's figuring this out. Anybody who's experienced in the world of running realizes that all of this stuff, I mean, Nike knows from its own market research that it has to. You know, the motion control's never been proved to do anything. Stability never been proven. Cushioning never been proven. So that they know it's not working. But they sell it anyway because people like it. You know, it, it, it looks like it works. So, no, I think they knew it. Um, the question was not whether they knew it, whether the customers knew it. And so if the customers don't know it, Nike's job is to meet demand. And people are demanding cushioning. When people demanded minimalism, they sold them Nike Freeze. Did you know of anyone else that had tried to call out the... Uh, shoe companies before you you put it in a book. Did you you know, were you aware of other people having tried doing this and you know, falling on deaf ears or or, or anything? Or, or were you genuinely feel like you know it's amazing why no one else has said this? Now's the time to say it. People were saying it. People were living it. Um, I think the difference was that 
Let me put it this way. I, I'm glad I wrote Born to Run at a point where I wasn't really sure about this stuff myself. You know, the only barefoot runner I ever met was Barefoot Ted, and, and I was like the last guy that I was going to like raise my flag over. <laughs> so, and, and at the time of Born to Run, I was still running in cushioned running shoes. Like, mm. I was taking the stuff on board. I believed the theory. It seemed to make sense. But I was still very early on in the process. And so I think Born to Run comes across as a quest for knowledge, not mm. as, you know, a, a, like a burning spear across the ramparts. Mm. And I think that's the reason why it landed, because I think a lot of readers, and here's another thing too, guys, is I'm pretty sure lots and lots of people were like a millimeter away from reaching the same conclusion themselves. You know, we've all yeah. bought all the shoes. We go back every six months, like, where, where the hell is the shoe I bought last week? Why is, why is it gone? You know, that bewildering wall of footwear is, you get the feeling that you're being fooled. And so I think a lot of experienced runners are like, something's going on with this footwear. And then that was it. So I was able to present the story in a way where people are like, that's it. You know, that's the last piece I was looking for. And that, that's what my question next question was going to be, actually. That do, do you think it could have been told by anyone else and had such an impact? Because the reality of that book, as you say, it's just one chapter where it really analyzes the, the trainer. And so the vast majority of the people who read the book is just because it's a lovely book to read and a beautiful story of, of many different characters. And, and do you think that you that you could have been packaged in any other way to have as big an impact as it did for barefoot running? I don't I don't think so because one one reason why is that the longevity of the book too. Um, you know, Born to Run still when it came out, I assumed that. Hey, you know, it's a lucky hit. Um, it, it came at the right time. And then mm. eventually a couple other running books are going to come through and just blow it away. It'll be forgotten. But, you know, mm. it's still to this day, it's still a really, really popular book. And I think that was just it. I think it, it captured a rare moment of um, real joy and, and friendship mm. and adventure and, and love. You know, I, I think. One thing I've recognized about the books I write is that I really, really like the people that I write about. And so I just saw Barefoot Ted a couple of weeks ago, and he's freaking lunatic, man. He's nuts. <laughs> but I got to say, I really love the dude, man. Jen Shelton, <laughs> I love her. I think she's fantastic. Uh, Eric Gordon, great. So I, I think what people are experiencing with Born to Run is a really cool hangout with really likable people so the thing about the book is that it is just packed with characters and that's the mm. thing it's packed with characters, which makes me wonder like who did you leave out like you must have come across people that like in time narratives that you must have left out or you met mm. people who were probably really good but they were incredibly boring compared with some of the really interesting mm. characters you were i mean yeah what were there any kind of like omissions that that, that you you just had to, you know, you had to, you would work through in order to keep the, the narrative as tight as it was. So n no first person experiences get, got dropped out uh, because, you know, again, I was new to this world. Uh, yeah. Before going down the Copper Canyon, I had never met an ultramarathoner in the flesh. The first one I ever met was Scott Jory. Uh, that was the first ultramarathoner. So, and then when I came back, I went around to each of these people's homes. So Ted and Jen and Billy, I went to all their homes, hung out with them re-reported everything and spent time with them. I, I tried to run Leadville that summer, got timed out the 50 mile mark. But then I was like bunkered down working on this book for two years. So my experience with, with the ultra marathoning world was really limited to a very small group. However, when you start to hear stories, like that's the stuff I had to leave out because there's one section in the middle where I'm describing the Leadville Trail 100. And I just started to stack up like one crazy mm. ass marathon story after the other that I heard. I heard about a guy, and to this day, I'm, I'm not positive that I heard this, but I'm almost positive that Marshall Ulrich told me that there was a guy that used to every year run the Leadville Trail 100, and at the summit of Hope Pass, he would pull over and masturbate. <laughs> and, <laughs> So again, it's it's been years since I believe Marshall told me this story. Is there a small uh, pile at the top now? <laughs> is there like oh, is there oh. one point where it's like it's just, 
yeah. it's a stalagmite. A stalagmite. Yeah. Of, 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 yeah. So, but here's the thing about it, Ward. So I, I would hear that kind of a story, you know, and you start to stack those stories up, and I, and I put it in the book, and my, my editor was like, you know what? Certain ones you just don't want to investigate. <laughs> That's right. Oh, you want to, you, I want to find that's, out if it's possible for one. Yeah. That's a big question. Like, you know, is it possible? But you hear these stories, and then in the middle of the book, my my editor is like, you know what? It, it's just too much, man. It's just like you know, one head pivot from side to side, like this guy, then this guy, then this guy, to just stick with your main characters. But story like that, like that's the kind of stuff I wanted to cram in. And he's like, it's it's just too nuts, man. Leave it out. <laughs> and um, what? What's happened? Like, what's been in the impact of, for the individuals of the book coming out? People like um, Eric, Jen, you mentioned Ted, and those individuals, because you, you mentioned them full name, um, and at, at a time when people still cared about Facebook and were still inviting Facebook friends and were you know, getting excited by using the internet to actually reach out to people. Uh, did, have you got a sense of how it impacted their lives? Yeah, and what's a really gratifying thing is that we've all remained pretty close. Uh, and so I, I see them or hear from everybody uh, pretty often. So I, I just saw Louis Escobar and Ted and Eric Gordon in California a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I saw Billy Barnett. This is the best thing of all. So Billy Barnett, Billy Barnett is like the bare-chested stud on the cover of Born to Run. Um, he was like the, the Billy Bonehead, like the crazy party guy. So... It's beautiful. He lives in Hawaii now, and I, and I just saw him back uh, a couple months ago, and he shows up with his like lovely wife and their beautiful newborn baby, and to watch Billy Bonehead be this like <laughs> wonderful, gentle dad and this like beautiful husband, and he works at a school for uh, seriously challenged, basically juvenile delinquents in, in a word. Mm -hmm. So he works the opposite of the tough. And Billy just out crazies them, you know? He's just like, he's like <laughs> yelling and like, so I think the effect has been that, um, you know, they had a, a brief um, period in, in, in the sunlight and some chose to embrace it in certain ways. Other people just got on with their lives. Like Jen has gotten into like schemo and salmon fishing. She was like on a salmon boat in Alaska and she's now, she has had a baby and, She's living on in the Alaskan outback homesteading because, of course, she is. Wow. Um, uh, Barefoot Ted. So Barefoot Ted had this wonderful moment where Manuel Luna taught him how to make warachis, and Ted created a company called Luna Sandals, and he named it after Manuel Luna, and he makes these beautiful Luna sandals, these uh, magnificent warachis. But every year, Ted returns to the canyons and personally hands a wad of cash to Manuel Luna who I'm sure has no idea why the fuck he's doing it, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but here, here's the thing about it. So I think the thing about it was the reason why those people were down there in the first place was because they had that sense of like independence and joy. That's why they mm -hmm. went. And it's been characteristic of their lives ever since. And it, it almost seems like a time when, but like now it just doesn't feel not to do with COVID, but just the world seems so small that wherever you go, you almost meet fairly normal people. Whereas it, it seems back then when you're writing the book that actually if you went somewhere like Copper Canyon, it would just be the, ex the extreme characters who've actually made that, that journey. And do you think, do, do you get a sense now that if you, when you go back there, that it is, like how, how has that changed specifically that region, would you say? So I get so two comments on that. One is that, uh, yeah, anything that is exposed then becomes oversaturated for sure. And so there are races that continue down in Copper Canyon, but the Chihuahua Tourism Board has now realized mm -hmm. this is an economic driver. So they really promote the races and they build up a lot around them. So they're, they're not, it's not the kind of little grassroots operation with Caballo just like, you know, messing around and, fucking shit up left, left and right. Um, so that, 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 it's still a small race. It's still a hard place to get to. It's still extraordinarily charming and fun. But yeah, it, it's not the, the sort of backwoods adventure that it was back then. But that said, those adventures were out there all over the place. You know, uh, I, I wrote this book called Running with Sherman about 
burro racers, people who run next to their donkeys in Colorado. So this is a group that most people have never heard of, full of characters, like real hardcore characters, super fun. So the things are out there. Um, and uh, as long as you are willing to say, hey, I'm, I'm more curious than competitive, then you're yeah. going to find you're going to find some cool stuff. And um, and actually, it was interesting. We we spoke to um, Sam, a friend of mine, who organises Ultra X, and they they do an ultra race through Cobb Canyon. Um, and he was saying that they took Jason Slab down there, who's won Len Lenville 100 before, and quite a few other good ultra runners. Um, I can't remember the other runner who I think was um, Golden was uh, UTMB World Series winner, and. On the, on the first day, because the, they have a Taramanga running with them, on the first day, their kind of top racer um, had a bit of a shocker. And everyone was thinking, Ooh, right, is this just all hype about them? And then the second day, he took so much distance out of them that um, I know Jason said that he doesn't think there's anyone on earth, including like Pau Capay and Killian, who could have competed with him that day in that performance. Um, like, do you, do you get a sense now that are they getting a lot more opportunities, Taramang, and are they still seen and, and regarded in the same way? Has, has running changed for them? Well, the thing about it is it has always been different for them. And this, this concept of a bunch of people lining up and there's someone shooting a gun and you running off for individual glory, it's something that is really weird for the mm. rock. They don't, they don't do that. You know, their races tend to be these like multi-day a team event and a race will go on for like 48 hours nonstop and it'll be in front of your entire village. And so, you know, the, their typical way to race is more akin to cross country. We have two teams and each team has a wooden ball. And then, so you're five or seven or eight players on your team. You can only run as far as the ball has been flipped and you catch up with the ball and you flip it. And then you run a mile and then you go back a mile back and forth and your entire village is there feeding you like, you know, pinole and water and cheering you on. This idea of like, oh, let's get 100 strangers, we'll all run off individually into the mountains, is kind of like weird. And like, okay, I'll you know I'll try it if you guys want to. It's not like mm. what we and, and that's why attempts in the past to translate the, you know, Raramuri endurance and stamina into a conventional Western racing format usually that doesn't work because it's just not what they do. They don't give a shit about the Olympics. They don't care. You know, mm. gold medal means nothing leaving their home to compete somewhere else is very, you know, unsettling. And so I, I think it's hard to make those comparisons because it is like one of those things where you try to, com you know, compare like a rugby player from the thirties with someone today, you know, it's different mm. body, different shapes, different competitions. I, I think what people identify rightly is that their unbelievable depths of stamina are very hard to, and, and you mentioned mm. UTMB, like that's the kind of place where, you would see, I'd be curious to see the, the Ramoni at UTMB because something that long, that hard, those kind of climbs, like that mm. is playing to their strengths. Yeah, but something like that. a 50 mile, 50 mile you know, race, which essentially these days is kind of a sprint, that's really not their strength. I guess as well, it's, it's really hard to take someone from, from that location and actually get them to, to race in any of the big ultras like UTMB and, and perform because with travel, with altitude, with temperature, um, and then with nutrition, all these things, actually, there's so much they'd have to learn to even not, well, to even make the, to get to the finish, let alone to be able to then run to their true ability. Um, yeah. And, um, and how, how have, how, what's your view on the impact of like, because you've, you've really changed diet to a certain extent and things like chia and, come, and various other foods coming through has been off the base, you know, off the back of the book food companies were trying to cash in on, right, what's everyone eating from this magical tribe? Let's try and create it. Like, have you, do you think anyone's managed to capture that? And do you think that, you know, what's your view on that? So I wrote a book called Natural Born Heroes, where I was looking at World War II resistance fighters in Crete and mm -hmm. looking at the diet. And for that book, I was spent a lot of time talking to a guy named Phil Maffetone. And Maffetone, mm -hmm worked a lot with Mark Allen and the elite triathletes in those uh, sort of the, the glory days of the 90s. And mm. Moffatone has this uh, saying, like, you know, you can't outrun a bad diet. And unfortunately, what most of us do is, you know, we put 
the running before the diet or like, you know, what? I'll I'll use running as a punishment for pizza. You know, that basically I'll eat whatever I want and I'll just try and burn it off with running, which is a horrible approach because essentially your training is being dictated by your consumption. And it should be the other way around. You know, your consumption should be dictated by your training. And I think so the pros and cons are that I think we, we all love to just buy the pill. You know, we just want to buy the cure as opposed to learning the skill. Matter of fact, that's kind of a nice little rhyme there. I'm going to make sure to use that. We want to buy the pill, not learn the skill. I'm going to use that. And so what happened was, so you have something like, like you know, so chia has become, it's easily adaptable. You know, it's easy to grow the seeds, easy to put it into a smoothie. Pinola is a little bit more difficult because it's it's a heritage corn which has to be grown then dried and when you dry it it's like not that tasty the companies have tried to like promote pinole as the miracle food but mm -hmm. what people don't understand is like there's no miracle you know it's not like the tabo mater are eating a lot of like ice cream and then throwing some chia on top no they're eating almost nothing and so their calories are coming from the chia and the pinole period mm -hmm. i think what we try to do is like take this thing not change anything else and just add it as opposed to taking things away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Still doing it. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> I, right? I just, dude, I'm just as guilty too. You know, like, it, yeah, cut a little bit away. You think you're doing something good and not really. Is, have you have you ever met people that have, um, you know, have, have obviously read the book, but have taken the wrong lessons from it? <laughs> they were like, they, they said to you, oh, do you know, I, yeah, you, you, you've taught me this. And you're like, that's, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant at all. Because it, it, just because of the vast number of people that have read it and the vast number of people that will have taken something, you must have met someone who's, you just went, wow, that's a, an interpretation I never had. And you've completely got that wrong. Well, the, easy, the easiest one was with the Bieber and Five Fingers. So, mm. and this was, I would hear this thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of times, because I would just get my inbox would be just jammed. And it mm. almost always be exactly the same thing. Like, thanks so much. I read your book. Now, I bought the shoes. When I went, I went, dude, when did I ever say buy shoes? You know? But it seemed to be, oh, your book said to buy the Vibram Five Fingers, and then I'm good to go. And, and I'm like, in my book, I never even wear Vibram Five Fingers. But it seemed to be that just that was that the takeaway from the book was, oh, all I got to do is buy these pocket shoes and then everything's good. And I'm like, dude, that was not the message at all. The message was, this is a skill you have to learn. What you wear on your feet is irrelevant, you know, as long as you learn the skill. So that was basically it. And I, I still feel like to this day, that, that lesson never really landed that running is a skill. Like that does not, to me, those would be the, the four words which summarize the book. And I don't think it's ever really landed. Yeah, I, well, it's, it's always been hijacked by Vibram as well, isn't it? They they weren't an, a company that I think many people in the UK were aware of at all before the book came out. And then they they almost were like, read the book, here's, here's the next chapter, and um, did that very successfully. And um, like looking at it now, like how do you feel about the way the running industry has changed? And we, we spoke briefly earlier about the fact that a lot of people now are, are barefoot runners. A lot of people have come injured, um, and there, there's, there's still, I wouldn't say, is a huge amount of understanding of transitioning and, and things along those lines. Like, how, how do, you, what's your view on, on what the world's done? Well, you know, again, you can't really lay the blame at the feet of the manufacturers. The manufacturers are meeting demand. Uh, their, their job is not to be, you know. Penning those saints trying to cure the world's ills, their job is to make money. And the difficulty I found is the amount of resistance and pushback from the running pundits, uh, you know, the, the podiatrists and the coaches and the running shoe store people and the running magazines. Mm. To me, I just don't understand the logic where why is it that they believe that running is the only activity on planet Earth where there's no better or worse way to do it. You know, if you're ice skating or playing golf or playing basketball, it's a skill that you have to practice. Except for running, where just do whatever you do, you know? And they say it over and over again. Don't try to change your natural form. Run the way you run. You can't change your form. Like, why the fuck can you not change your form? <laughs> like, and that's the thing that gets me. And it's, well, you know, we're not too sure about this heel. We're not too sure. Like, dude, you're sure. 
it's clearly there's been like millions of years of evolutionary evidence. The running shoe is a very limited lifespan. We just invented it like in the 1970s, 80s. We've been running for millions of years without them. And so that's the thing that bothers me is that I, I don't really care. Like I like running shoes too. Like, you know, the New Balance Minimus, great shoe. Innovate, man. I love Innovate shoes. They're amazing. Um, uh, Vigo Barefoot, great shoes. So, I mean, and I am just as like mm. tempted by a, a tasty, shiny thing as anybody else. The only thing that bothers me is, man, I just wish that people would embrace this idea mm. that if you learn the skill of running, then you could be injury free for life and then buy whatever you want to buy. Do you, do you really believe that injury free for life thing? I mean, yeah, yeah. There are things that are going to contribute. If I overdo things, I'll, I'll pay the price for it. But I know what exactly went wrong. You know, mm. and so if I go for a run and if I just say, you know what, I'm just going to do seven minute miles for 10 miles because I'm competing with these guys. Well, I'm going to pay a price, man. I'm going to rip my hamstring or something. But I know what I did. I think what plagues most people is that I got this nagging twinge in my Achilles. I don't know why. You know, I got uh, cuboid syndrome or plantar fasciitis. I don't know why. And the answer is change the behavior. And people don't do that. They don't adjust their form. They don't try a different uh, stride or foot strike. And to me, that's it. You know, that if there's, there is a behavioral remedy for these problems, not just like uh, a device. And do you think there's a, because early adopters and now even barefoot runners, seem to be a personality type as opposed to a, a running style almost. It, it's, it's almost taken on a, a slight cultish community. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a lifestyle, isn't it? It's like a yeah, lifestyle. Yeah, like a lifestyle it's choice. Like, it, 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 everything comes with it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're like the crossfitting vegans of the running world. <laughs> yeah. I said yeah. there is a hippie, there's a hippie quality to it, definitely. But... Yeah. Uh, I think, um, good question. I, I, I don't know. To me, again, it seems so self evident I guess I'm one of them. You know, it's just, uh, to, me, there, to me, there's no argument. Like, to me, I'm sure, it, it's just actually, it is pretty similar with vegetarians. There is no logical defense of the meat industry anymore, okay? Uh, I believe that eating meat is a really good uh, nutrition source for the human body, but I have no doubt that we mistreat animals in ways that makes it unethical. Now, I'm a meat eater myself, so that's basically it. I, I believe it, that we should not be doing it, yet I do it. To me, it's similar with barefoot running, which is that, to me, I have no question about it. You change your form, you will improve your running performance and longevity. And I think when you believe it that passionately, like, you, you just kind of live it. You just don't even want to have the argument anymore. Mm. Because well, I, think, I think, do you think, do you think the the popularity of the book and the fact that so many people went out and did barefoot running before they were um, sort of, sort of ready, before they really understood they had the you know you needed to do a transition, and before there was that sort of broader understanding from people that you need to do it. Do you think actually that's held barefoot back because a lot of people went out, caused all sorts of problems, and only now. It's kind of like the, 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 everything's matured a little bit and people are being much more sensible about it because mm. it, it feels like it's gone in a wave. I don't know whether you agree with that, mm. David. It felt like there's a wave. Yeah, it Lots does. Of yeah. Doing it, massive pushback and then people are going back to it again, but doing it in a, in a very different mm. way, in a much more mature way because they, people are much more supportive. Do, do, is, that, is that a characterization you would recognize at all, Christopher, or? I'm not completely wrong. Yeah, right? I think so. I mean, one thing was, it's, it's kind of curious. So one thing was the Viva and Five Fingers themselves are a great shoe, a great device. But because they look weird, they, they were mocked and ridiculed a lot. So mm. the, the association with barefoot runnings was with these Viva and Five Fingers. And so that was an easy sort of target for, for school. Yeah. And mm. So, uh, oh, you're one of those guys, you know? And, and people, you know, <laughs> they're, they're like the Met Gala in their Viva and Five Fingers. So. <laughs> I was putting a target on their back right off the bat. Um, but you're right, though, too. I mean, we did a – it was a barefoot – John Durant put on, like, a barefoot running festival on Governor's Island in New York. And he had the entire island, and people were running barefoot. And uh, me and this guy named Pete Larson, who's a researcher from Vermont, he was videotaping the runners. And we were just, like, cringing because people were in the five fingers. And they are like, still, like, slamming down their heels, like, 
they mm. were running into five fingers as if they were running in cushioned shoes and they had changed mm. nothing. And it was just like, Ugh, that looks painful. So yeah, there was definitely that wave of like unpopular looking shoe, uh, disastrous uh, uh, form and technique. And so yeah, I think there would have been a lot of casualties. Since then, I don't, I don't really know. I think one thing that minimalism is up against is that the two driving forces of running are footwear and races. Mm -hmm. And neither one of those things lends itself to the amount of time and discipline it takes to learn a skill. You know, yeah. if your goal is to run a race in three months, you're not going to spend two of those months just learning how to gradually change your form. And do you, do you think it's, it's almost going to be, it's, it's moving backwards now to a certain extent because of things like the Nike Vaporfly. Now that there are trainers that actually will make you run faster, that's changing people's priorities away from necessarily thinking about long-term health and thinking, how can I run that race faster? And it, it's also, you don't get barefoot vapor fly. Yeah, yeah, I, I think one thing is like, I also don't want to be like, sound come across like a sourpuss, like mm. bitching nonstop about shoe companies. Because uh, mm. the thing about running is it's fun and, and new, new, mm. new shoes are fun and they're exciting and they're kind of cool. But, but I do sort of acknowledge it's, it's just the kind of thing where you want to bang your head against the walls. Like it's not about speed, you know, stop focusing mm. on fast. That's all we think because we're not, none of us are. You know, I get the vapor, vapor fly. It's not going to make a goddamn difference. You know, the, the the 10th of a second that it will improve my time over. It's not putting me in the top 10 in London, you know? So to me, that's, that's the, I guess the unfortunate thing is we get so focused all the time. Mm. Drava, did you beat the guy in Italy today? You know, on that course, you know, are you a little bit faster than you were yesterday? It's just speed, speed, speed all the time. And I'm like, dude, forget the speed, man. Just focus on the skill. Like when you go to a martial arts dojo, they're not like, hey man, how fast can you do that move? It's like, no, how well can you execute that move? And to me, like that's what I wish the conversation would someday turn toward is the skill, the proficiency. And then, then the speed, you know, that's what Caballo said. Um, you know, Mike Couture, one of the first things he ever said to me was, hey man, first focus on easy, because if that's all you get, that ain't so bad. You know, learn to run easy, then work on light, then work on, work on smooth. If you get easy, light, and smooth, you're fast. You've, you've accomplished it. Mm, yeah, interesting. And um, and how was how how was the book the long term impact? What did you say for the local tribes? Because there's a lot more visitors now. There's a far more awareness. They've got they could probably get into races easier. But has it fundamentally to change them? Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't really believe so. I mean, they're, they've got a pretty hard deck stacked against them. They live in a very vulnerable area in um, which should be protected areas and that are not protected. There's a lot of drug cartel activity, a lot of illegal mining and, and um, logging that goes on. Mm. I think that, you know, the, the, the Ramoni who actually compete in races are very few. And so a few of them, like Arnulfo and Silvino and Manueluna, are given opportunities to race, but the overwhelming majority of their culture is just trying to survive day to day in a place mm. where they're not really awarded a lot of respect or protection. And so the running aspect of their lives is really kind of small compared to the rest of the stuff that's going on that's, that's really difficult. Mm, okay. Um, now, I'd love to talk about the Running with Sherman for quite a while but do you want to tell us about natural born heroes for a kind of short intermission between yeah. running stories yeah yeah so it actually erupted from a, a running story uh i was researching born to run and again i just kind of threw the net out there for like you know what's all this stuff about running i, I never knew about before and let's get some of these out of print books and i ordered one book called the Cretan runner and it came, and I thought, oh, you know, it's going to be about like a marathoner from Crete. And I get the book, I'm like, oh, that's not, that's not it at all. It's actually about a, me a foot messenger during World War II. So I'm like, oh, well, this ain't going to help. So I put it aside. I continued to research and work on Born to Run, finished it. And then while the book was being edited, there's like a nine-month uh, lull between finishing the manuscript and then having it arrive in the, in the bookstores. So during those nine months, I'm kind of like cleaning out my office and you know, getting rid of books that I didn't need anymore. And I picked up this Cretan Runner book and thought, oh, let's take a look at this thing. 
So I read this story, and it's about a shepherd who became a foot messenger for the resistance on the island of Crete. Fascinating book. Mm. But what, what it started to get my curiosity uh, uh, peaked because this guy's telling stories about, so I was up in the mountains and we decided we were gonna raid the Germans the next morning. So I ran 30 miles through the mountains, gave the message to the other gang, okay, be ready at dawn. And the other gang said, nope, dawn's too early, tell them nine. So I ran 30 miles back, <laughs> gave the reply, they said, okay, nine's okay. So I ran 30 miles back, I said, whoa, dude, you did <laughs> 90 miles in the mountains off trail wow. on a diet of like, you know, alcohol and, and, and oats. Like, how, the, how do you do that? Like, how do you physically do it? And these it's are- It's a Scottish diet, is, is what you're saying. That's, <laughs> that's right, exactly right. It's a Scottish Tuesday. So, uh, so I, I became intrigued by this. And so I started to research the resistance in Crete. And what, what I discovered is that this guy was not alone. You know, that Crete was this island nation which had perfected this, the art of the hero. And it, it, dates back to ancient Greece, to a culture when there was no police force, there was no standing army, there was no fire department. Every citizen had to be a capable functioning protector of their own community. And so the, the, it's, the curious thing is on Crete, the word dromadeu for citizen is also the word for runner. Someone who can run to the rescue is a full citizen. So anyway, what happened in Crete was, this is the only place in military history where resistance fighters actually went behind enemy lines, kidnapped the commanding German general, got him back out through the lines, and then went on the run. And now the hard thing about this is you're on a fucking island. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> so 100,000 German soldiers are searching for these resistance fighters, and they're just running around the mountain, dragging this German general along, and they did it for 40 days, and they finally got him on a fishing boat, got him off to Egypt, and put him into an Allied prisoner of war camp. So, wow, this be, a, a film needs to be made. I agree, <laughs> completely yeah. agree. Or a reality yeah. TV show, it's- Something. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get them drunk and get them to snog every night. That would be the twist <laughs> for the, uh, <laughs> on the Scottish. Um... Oh, wow, so, and so does the book, does it tell the whole tale of that or is it, Focusing more on the individual runner of the from yesteryear, or yeah, it's the entire adventure story of this plan to go behind the lines, get this guy. What I love about it was the reason why it's never been done in military history before is because it's a terrible idea. Yeah, like yeah. if you ask any experienced soldier, like, hey, what do you think about this? Like, that's a horrible idea. You know, you never go behind, <laughs> you would never do this. But you take resistance fighters; they're just amateurs. Like. Sounds good to us. <laughs> so I tell that whole adventure story, but then I use it as a way to start to examine like the Cretan diets. Uh, I, I wanted mm. to know physio, how's this possible? And even temperamentally, you know, what makes you that kind of a person, both physically and temperamentally? And so I use the story of this adventure to look at, you know, this, this lost art of the hero, which, which still existed in Crete during the war. And how were people, alive from that period. How did you find out all the details? Yeah, um, so a few things. So Patrick Lee Fermer, who, hmm. you know, who is a, you know, a gigantic figure in, in the UK, he was still alive. And uh, unfortunately, I never got to speak to him because he was actually dying of throat cancer at the time. But um, his relatives and friends were very eager to sort of share stories. And then, um, there were a couple guys in the UK, these two brothers, uh, Chris and Pete, who had made it their own life's mission to actually recreate the exact route of the escape because, you know, Patty Lee Firmer and the other kidnappers, they, they didn't map it, they just ran. And so they said, oh yeah, we, you know, on, on this day we were here, on that day we saw the sunrise, on another day we had a piece of bread in this village. And so these two brothers took it upon themselves and spent years recreating the exact route of their escape. This sounds there. like an ultra, doesn't it? This is a Lee Stuart Evans style ultra. So there's a there's a route called the Monnet's Way, which um, Bonnie Prince Charlie, I think. Oh um, you've got you you are so you're so historically inaccurate with that. But <laughs> it was, Prince it was Charles. 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 Charles was trying to trying to escape <laughs> uh, during the the Civil War, and so 
basically he took the worst possible route you could possibly take through well it, it was hiding so you don't expect it to be on beautiful ridges across lovely rolling hills or anything else like that it's like basically gutters ditches anywhere else and it what was it 600 700 miles yeah about 700 just miles back at each other yeah. just like that just like that did you get it's, you know how... like, it's kind of like the barkley you know the barkley was the same thing it was uh uh the guy who shot um, martin luther king escaped from a prison in tennessee and after like 30 hours he'd only gone four miles and that's when uh laz laz lake said hey, you know what i'm sure i can go more than four miles so he created a ultra marathon the barkley in the same <laughs> terrain where a guy tried to escape prison Do you get a sense of how far they'd have gone in these 40 days uh yeah i actually uh hiked the route myself and it's it's slipping my mind but i believe it was in the vicinity of uh 60 some miles so me, oh, me and the, nice the one there for an ultra yeah it, it's it's definitely doable now also because um you're not really hiding from nazis and running by nights you know so <laughs> when, when you remove the threat of like vicious dogs and scraping machine gun fire it does seem a little bit easier well and how did how did it all end in crete you know did the resistance get them out or did germany re surrender first to the allies or you know it's a fascinating thing so two things happen one is there are german generals who went on trial at nuremberg who said the reason we lost wasn't because of d-day it's because of crete so what happened was you know hitler had just plowed through western europe that mm. one day a three day bam then he gets to greece and they think, okay, they, they gave um, 20 hours was going to be for the occupation of Crete. And they needed Crete as a way station because it's, it's that port island between Africa and Europe. So mm. there's a way of getting troops. They can control northern Africa and then take things from northern Africa into Russia. So they only needed Crete as like a springboard into Africa and um, Eastern Europe. Mm. If 20, 20 hours, three weeks later, they're still fighting these goddamn Greeks who won't stop <laughs> fighting. <laughs> they can't walk in the island. And so it put Hitler off by a month. So he was supposed to be um, charging into Russia in August, but he ends up going there in early uh, October. And that's when they got smacked by snow and hail and rain. And so a lot of German generals said, if we'd only locked down Crete in August, we would have won the war. But they got to Russia late. They got snowed in. They got destroyed by the Red Army. And that gave the U.S. the courage to now enter the fight. So on the one hand, you could say it's because of those wacky shepherds slowing things down that they were actually put that one little bit of grit into the gear work. Um, but the sad thing is, when you go to Crete today, this was horribly violent fighting and retribution for, you know, six years. But you go there today, it's like it never happened. And that's mm. kind of a horrible tragedy of war is – People are just suffering, suffering, suffering. And then years later, like, for what? What was the point? What was the point of any of it? We're right back where we were before. Why do we even do any of that kind of stuff? What do you think? What do you mean we're right back where we were before? That when you go to Crete today, everything that was paid for in blood has not changed the island. The people are still living the same way. The, the island looks the same way. And so all of this, like, agony and turmoil that took place didn't change anything didn't change the, mm -hmm. the people's lives today or the island today and so it's not to say that they shouldn't have resisted but it, it does mm -hmm. kind of bring up the question of like yeah, what's the point of all this stuff we fight and fight and fight why you know how Although in, in a way isn't isn't that the isn't wouldn't that be their argument is that they fought to try and keep things the same yeah again it's, it's not an easy question to answer um mm -hmm. but you think of all those thousands of people who were tortured and died you know mm. I, I don't know what the answer is this is kind of the eternal question of armed conflict which is that you know for both the aggressors and the resistors what 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 good does it do it doesn't do anything it doesn't make anybody anyone's lives any better eventually things revert to the way they were so why do why were we torturing each other in the first place so basically what they should have done instead of going to crete for the Cretans. They should have gone to like a French island, is what you're probably saying. <laughs> Use that as their 
<laughs> Sardinia French, one of those ones. Did you ever that see that was their solution. Corsica, 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 Corsica that's the one. Just swept, <laughs> swept through Corsica pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, went right that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Greece, Greece is that way. Yeah. <laughs> so then on to, um, on to Running with Sherman, which is the latest book. And uh, you've mentioned a little bit about it. This is what I'm quite excited about. So tell us about how this has come about. As we do this, I'm going to uh, move because um, I got to plug in here before we plunge into, oh, here we go, got to find a cord. Yeah, so Running with Sherman was, hang on guys, I may be a little bit obscured, but only briefly. Find a plug. So Running with Sherman was a, an accidental book. I was, um, we were living on our farm in Pennsylvania and my daughter who was nine thought it would be a good idea to ask for a donkey for her 10th birthday. And <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Why listen Jamie to knows your over? pain and actually, Jamie, Jamie knows your, he's just bought his, his daughter a, uh, a dressed up donkey. So, uh, right? a pony, a pony, not quite, yeah. I'm not sure she'll, but you'll appreciate you calling it a donkey there, but. <laughs> <laughs> you bought your daughter a pony? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I didn't really have much of a say in it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> she worked out his like pin number. <laughs> yeah. well, hang on, so you're down Brighton with a pony? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a pretty good life, Jody. <laughs> is, it, is it really? It doesn't feel like it. It feels like it's, it's one of, of just constant... There's there that saying. There's that saying in terms of investment that um, you should never, you should never invest in anything that eats while you sleep. Um, <laughs> and that's, you know, you, there's no, there's no way you're ever going to keep up with the, um, uh, with with feeding it, with everything else that goes with it. Invariably, stuff that goes wrong. Because when something goes wrong with a living thing, that's the worst kind of thing. Because it's not like something goes wrong with a, you know, a mechanical thing. You can just scrap it. Very hard to. Say so just scrap it um, when it's. I mean, it's safe. not hard. It's just potentially unethical. <laughs> yes. <exactly. sighs> I don't know, but I feel like I'm, I'm experiencing a very British moment. Like, here's a man who, the daughter who lives on a beautiful English <laughs> seaside, and he's got a pony, <laughs> and all he's doing is fucking whinging. <laughs> I know. Well, it, does, it does seem as though it does seem as though I'm complaining about this, uh, and I'm not really. I'm not really complaining about it. It's it's really lovely, and it's it's really nice. Um, there you go. But so, Christopher, this is the in, This is the real insight that we found out because I found this out two weeks ago. I think in Jodie's mind, he's justified this as being part of her personal development with the long-term possibility that maybe this could see her enter the Olympics in the modern pentathlon. That now, was the idea. Two weeks after he bought that pony, they've decided that they're probably going to switch horse riding for cycling. <laughs> it, because of Jody. Because <laughs> of me. They're just working. That's, right, that's, right. that's the influence his hatred has. <laughs> they're thwarting me. They thought, I tell you what would be hilarious. Just as he buys that pony, let's switch ponies. <laughs> that's right, wait, wait, guys. Let's right. hold off. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, <laughs> that's <it. laughs> unbelievable. So you brought your daughter a an ass. I'm not quite sure the way I like the way you said that. But what happened was, um, we were out on a hike one day in the woods, and uh, we saw this woman riding a donkey. Like she comes up the trail on a donkey with a, with a saddle. And uh, it was really kind of cool. She hops off the donkey, and we're all, like, petting it and feeding it power bars, and we're all charmed. And then we all forget about it, you know. So nine months later, it's out of my mind. But that's when my daughter brought it back up. She's like, I, I want a donkey like that. And uh, I kind of thought, that's actually kind of a cool idea because, you know, we had this <laughs> farm. We had the land. We had fencing. Um, but donkeys are hard to come by in Pennsylvania. It's not like an East Coast animal. You know, it's a Colorado mountain animal. So the only one we could locate was being held by this hoarder that we heard about. Some guy had it locked in his barn, and his neighbors were sort of desperate to get it away from him, but he wasn't letting it go. And so we went and checked it out, and um, we thought, yeah, well, there's no way we're leaving it here. So uh, luckily, one of his neighbors was able to go to bat and persuade this guy to take the donkey out of his barn and give it to us. But the problem was, like, as you said, Jody, is like 
all of a sudden you have responsibility for this living thing. I'd never dealt with a donkey before. This thing was foundered so badly, its hooves were like like swim fins. Uh, it couldn't move. Its its oh, hooves wow. had never been trimmed. Of course, it, they just uh, grow, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they grew like there's like like uh, like like sleigh runners. It couldn't walk. It was diseased and sick, uh, catatonic. And how was that birthday party? <laughs> yeah, here you go, hun. <laughs> There, there was that moment I'm thinking to myself, like, this is going to be the worst 10th birthday ever. You know, like, the thing's going to be dead in the front yard. Uh, but we, we tracked down that woman that we saw in the woods. You know, luckily people knew who she, who she was. We bring her over. And tracked her down, you're her. like, you! It was you! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only here for one reason. This time, that's not yours. <laughs> but um, what, one thing she told us, so she sort of... <laughs> to the rescue but she's like you know dude you got to find a way to make this thing move you know you can't just leave it standing around you got to get it moving or else it's going to die and i'm like I, what, what the fuck am i going to do so that's when i got the idea of like i wonder if i can make this thing my running partner and get it to run with me and that's how it all kind of snowballed into this bizarre adventure where we ended up with three donkeys and a little team of runners and we ended up going to colorado for a uh, a borough race where we ran, you know, an ultra marathon with our donkeys side by side. And was was that a race that because Western States used to be like a horse race that then you'd yeah, yeah. horses against. So what was the race already established for men and their donkeys? Yeah. So. Um, I, I appreciate you not using that opportunity to squeeze another ass joke in there. <laughs> I did. I don't <laughs> Men riding their asses. <laughs> uh, so what happened was there was a, a, an old prospector's tradition of like when you strike gold, you throw all your gear on the back of your donkey and then you run to the nearest town. And so then the, the prospectors who have a little bit of gold start to race each other with their donkeys. So th this is a tradition dating back to the 1800s of guys and their donkeys running side by side from like bar to bar from one town to the next. And, and it just continued. And so in the 1950s, the state of Colorado made it like a state sport, the state sport of borough racing. <laughs> and with all stupid activities, people started to take it very seriously. And so guys would like, you know, breed burrows specifically as racers and would train with them. And, uh, and it became a, you know, a pretty um, popular sport. So right now there's probably 10 or 12 different borough races in Colorado during the season. So uh, during the summer just, season, just in Colorado, or, or would this happen in other states of America? Yeah, they tried it a little bit in Arizona. It didn't really take hold. So it's almost exclusively in Colorado, in these little mountain towns. But it's a big deal. You know, you're a little mountain town. You have a population of like a thousand, and you hold a borough race. So everyone comes to town. There's lots of donkeys. It's easy to close off all the streets because there's not much traffic anyway, and a lot of it's up in these mountain passes. So it's a big, exciting moment for these small towns. And how, how does how does a how do you, how does a donkey train for that then? Like, is there like a sixteen-week <laughs> training period in order to get ready for the like? How like what, how do, how does that work in terms of are you is the donkey actually faster than you and you and you're speeding up for the donkey or what is the mm. how, how, how do the logistics work with that? I, I love this journey because you just sort of captured like my experience exactly like. <laughs> what what how the what the hell how does it happen like when I started I had no idea how the hell you do any of this stuff I knew these races existed I didn't know how you train it but <clears throat> uh, basically what it comes down to is this is that one thing that borough racers always say is like if you want a donkey to to do anything you got to make the donkey think that he thought of it first you know <laughs> it's got to be his idea and so you know the donkey doesn't know there's a race. He doesn't even know what's free, you know? So you've got to somehow create a, an inspiration, the donkey, where the donkey thinks, you know what, I think I feel like running five miles with this guy behind me today. I don't know why, I, I'm just in the mood. So you're like it's donkey like, whisperers. Yes, oh, completely. And that's the art. So I, there's a woman named Barb Dolan who is an amazing donkey racer, but she's been doing it for like 30 years. And uh, she said that sometimes she take a donkey and spend three years training it before she'll even try to race with it because she's just building up this 
nonverbal communication that this is what we're doing and that this is just what we do and getting it to learn to run to the point where when you see Barr running with a donkey, it's like the two of them are side by side. It's like she's with her running buddy and they're just running side by side. Uh, she has a little trick she does is that, so coming on a downhill descent, the donkeys can fly and you're coming down a 12,000 foot mountain, you're running down. And so sometimes the donkeys will go too fast. So Barb, rather than wasting the energy of pulling on the rope, she would just crinkle a candy wrapper in her pocket. And the donkey would be like, whoa, 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 slow right down. Because she trained the donkey, like, you know, whenever she crinkled the wrapper, she's going to give it a treat. And so <laughs> that's all she had to do. So you're racing Barb Dolan, and she's pulling shit out like that. There's no way you're going to beat her. Think about it. I, don't think, I don't think I've ever seen a, a, a donkey run. I, I can't ever picture a donkey running. I can't, I can't recall when I've seen that. I can only, I can only picture people sat on donkeys and then moving very, very slowly. I, I'll I, tell you I what, really my ass was running it. last night, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's a different story. But that's uh, a good point, Jay. <laughs> that's, that's a video none of us want to see. <laughs> that's true. I don't know why I published it. Well, he says that. He says that, but he posts all that stuff on Instagram all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I need don't, access to that private account. <laughs> donkeys overheat like ponies like because ponies seem like again you don't realize this until you until you buy one that literally everything can kill it including <laughs> movement and so they can like overheat do, do donkeys not overheat do donkeys have because uh, i just i don't i don't like, i don't picture them running <laughs> so i don't it feels as though they they all of a sudden in colorado they develop this special skill that, that, that they don't have anywhere else or they're or they're, they're being asked to do something that that you don't normally associate with them like is it are they are they are they weren't they weren't like bred to run were they they were bred to just be like solid stable animals so no no it's, it's an interesting thing because it's actually a beautiful natural marriage because donkeys are from north africa and they were long range grazers and browsers and so they're used to high heat and they used to cover a ton of terrain on very limited water to okay. get their food. And so, we're, you know, where we're donkeys thrive is deserts and high barren mountains. And that's why they became adopted for these kind of extreme missions. That's why, like, you know, if you're heading across the, uh, into, the, into the wilderness, you, you take a donkey for a couple of reasons. One is because they can survive really long time on limited food, limited water. But secondly, donkeys cannot be scared into be into behaving or obeying the way a pony or a horse can. Like, you know, you take the spurs into a horse, it'll jump off a cliff. You try to get a donkey to jump off a cliff, you're gonna have a very long afternoon because it ain't, it ain't gonna do it. A donkey's instinct under threat is to freeze and hold up. And so the beautiful thing about that is donkeys are very trustworthy. They won't take a wrong step. Um, but the downside is that if they're not sure of it, they're just not doing it and you can't make them do it. So. It's that combination of being really good on, on tricky uh, terrain, mm. uh, having an unbelievable endurance, and a really good kind of cruising speed of like, you know, like say 15 miles an hour. They can just trot along briskly forever, like limitless. They can go all day at a nice crisp, you know, 10, 12 uh, minute per mile pace, nonstop. So you, you take them up on a mountain where you're at high altitudes, you're not running much faster than that anyway and you're going up a mountain pass, the donkey just cruises along, doesn't need water, doesn't need food. He won't make a mistake and, you know, and, and step off the cliff. And so you can run next to one for, and you know, the, the world championship pack barrel race is, is a 29 mile race at high altitude. And these donkeys handle it, you know, easily. And, and what motivates the donk? Cause I assume carrot and stick is related to them, but well, what motivates them to actually run? And how do you then actually get them to follow a race course route? So it's a beautiful thing. There was, a, there was a, an event recently, so Solomon, as kind of a shtick, brought um, Ryan Sands and Max King, like two of the greatest, most successful ultra runners alive today, to Colorado to compete in the World Championship Pack Burrow Race. And they gave them two very well-trained, very successful burrows, like two burrows which have won the races before. And they gave him a trainer, a human trainer who was a great donkey trainer. And so those of us in the pack barrel racing community kind of looked on this with a little bit of alarm because 
if a couple of ringers can be brought in and dominate the sport, then, then we're nothing special. You know, then we're not bringing anything to the table because anybody can show up. And if you're mm. fast and they give you a good dunk, you'll win. These guys got destroyed. destroyed. <laughs> 12 year old girls were beating the shit out of them. <laughs> and we were just like, yeah! Like, so but the did, they, why, did they film all of this, Solomon? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can find it. You can find that video online. Like, look up Solomon Mexican Burrow, you know? Brilliant. We were so, like, Schadenfreude about this is because it, to us, the art, the beauty of it, is that you need to form a true partnership with the animal. You gotta log the kinship miles, you know? You gotta show up every day and develop a, a, a personal relationship with the donkey and you, you can't force it. And so those of us have thought, okay, today's a sucky day, I'm hot as shit, I'm getting bitten by flies, this donkey's not co you know, cooperating at all, but it's gonna pay off someday. If someone else could just steal that glory by just showing yeah. up, they would kind of discredit the whole thing. So it was wonderful to see them just come in miserable and tired and, and <laughs> defeated. And who wins, fastest runner with good donkey or fastest donkey with good runner? Fastest runner with good donkey. Because, well, basically, you know, yeah, fastest runner with good donkey. It, it all depends on that, is that any donkey will be fast enough, you know. Mm -hmm. and just about any donkey has got the raw speed to do it today. Um, it's hard for a runner to, fastest runner who's developed the best donkey. That's yeah. it. So, yeah. And so, you know, Barb, so Barb Dolan um, and uh, Hal Walter and Curtis Emery, they're all super, like, and, uh, Barb Dolan was like an Olympic caliber uh, cyclist. Um, and when she turned herself to burrow racing, but she's devoted years to developing this thing with her donkeys. And so I watched, I watched Barb destroy every man and woman in the field of fast runners. And these guys were 30 miles at uh, 12,000 feet in like three hours and 30 minutes. It's unbelievably mm. fast. But it mm. all realized the, the donkey could end your day in a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah, of course. And um, and are there, are there other communities like this you've found with other sports or with like, do they, do, do you see yourself trying to cause hunt, hunt out community? For journalism yeah. state. Kind of. I think what happens is um, these projects are such a slow burn. They take so long to accomplish. So, you know, for Running with Sherman, again, it was an over two-year, three-year, really, because you get the idea, you start to experiment with it, you have the events, you spend another mm. year to write the book, then you promote the book. So it's like three years go by. And during those three years, you sort of get wind of something else you're curious about. So, you know, kind of one wandering eye is checking out the other thing while you're actually working on the, in the project at, at hand. Is there anything and, that you you went off to kind of explore or you were curious about? You thought, oh, this this sounds like it could be great. And then when you start looked into it, you thought, actually, this is this is rubbish. Yeah, uh, not not that the event was rubbish, but it was the wrong story for me. So. I was really intrigued by female big wave surfers. So, you know, the kind of people who go to Nazare and like, you know, uh, uh, surf those 100 foot waves. And it's this utterly male dominated sport. But what caught my attention was, it's not just dominated because it's a lot of dudes, it's dominated because the women are banned from competing in the competitions. Like there's one called Mavericks and the Eddie Aikau big wave competition, it's men only. And so I thought, how 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 they get away with that? Yeah. And so I thought, you know, and so there, these female big wave surfers are out there. Um, how does it feel to be risking your life at mm. this very difficult sport and be told you're not good enough to even show up on opening day? And so um, I went out to Mavericks, which is this gigantic surfer. It's kind of the American uh, uh, Nazare. And I hung out there for a few days with female uh, big wave surfers. And uh, I was basically asking the same question and I would sort of relate to them what I've been told. So the male surfers told me like, well, you know, the women, they're just not strong enough to go through these waves because these are a hundred foot waves and you got to dive underneath them, you got to hold your breath. And these women are just not physically strong enough. So I was asking the women like, well, what do you make of this? And like, you think those guys are strong enough? It's a fucking hundred foot wave. Like, they're not doing anything. <laughs> Did you ever see a male surfer? They're about 
five foot five, a hundred pounds. You know, these guys aren't like, it's not like Dwayne Johnson out there. Yeah. And so they completely blew up all the rationales for excluding them. And I spent a couple of days watching them on these waves. It was unbelievable, you know. Uh, but then I decided, so I, I, that was going to be the book for me. I was on fire. I really want to write about this uh, subculture of women and the oppression they're up against and the physical challenges of this kind of activity. But then I realized, you know what? It's a great story, but it's just not my story. Uh, I'm not a woman. I'm not a surfer. I haven't experienced that kind of discrimination. And I just felt too removed. Like there's nothing I can do to get myself in their shoes. Yeah. And so I would always be describing somebody else's experience. Hmm. That's why I felt like I had to step away. Like somebody else is going to come along and do that story, but it's not for me. No, there's no, there's no element of your own journey in there. Right. Yeah. Right. I'll Although, never... I think you should go out there and do a hundred foot wave. That that sounds like the solution. <laughs> I mean, it's quite an obvious solution, surely. Well, Dave, it is, it is a team sport, Dave. So. You know. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it with a donkey. Come on. There you go. And and how does because, I mean, from what you've said about running with Sherman and from uh, Born to Run. You know, those two books are sound as if they're very heavily, there's a, there's a narrative, there's an overall um, different insight into, insight into a different community, but those are, they're driven by very large personalities. Whereas, um, whereas Natural Born Heroes, you don't really have the opportunity to have that relationship with an individual quite as much. Um, how much would you say good books, particularly of your style, rely on colourful characters? Or how much can the overall story of, uh, of, a, of a historical event or of a community kind of carry the weight of a book? Like, where would you say the balance lies between those two? You know, it's something I, I struggle with, and I don't think I've really landed on the on the answer um i don't think it's the the characters they, they always come um mm. i don't think i've ever been in a conversation with anybody where if you listen long enough or ask enough questions at some point they'll come out with an unbelievable story always mm. everybody so mm. everybody's got it I, again I, every time i'm in a conversation you just ask around a little bit ask around all of a sudden like, you did what you had sex with a prostitute on, on you know, <laughs> the Grand V On a donkey at the top of Bland Hill? Bland Hill. Maybe Sherman? So the stories are all there. The adventures are all there. To me, the difficulty is how do you narrate it? And so with Natural Born Heroes, you know, it's funny. I, I think I came off of the crest of Born to Run figuring, like, I've solved it. Like, yeah. I can do whatever I want. I've got this cracked. And then Natural Born Heroes, I feel like I went to an excess. Like I crammed so much stuff into that book because I felt like I'm the storytelling master, you know, like, <laughs> don't tell me, I'll tell you. And I feel like that book is a little, uh, it's too top heavy, man. There's too much going on. Okay. And I really mm -hmm. wish I'd stripped it down to a simpler narrative, which was right there. Um, that's what I, I try to do with running with Sherman. Like, let's keep it chronological. Let's get the, don't let the story get swamped by the digressions. And, and to get a sense of saying you are now to hear about a another, let's say it's a community or another story um, of you know, extreme tiddlywinkers or whatever it may be, um, how would you then, how would you approach finding out, finding those stories and where would you spend your time just, just to help any runner, writers out there who might be wanting to emulate the type of things you've done? I have to think long and hard whether I want to help anybody. <laughs> David, David's saying he means for himself. He's using this as an opportunity to to <laughs> basically get a free writing lesson. This this is what I've written this year, the the entire year. <laughs> <laughs> Total. So I may write a book, but I'm certainly I'm not going to live long enough to ever finish it. So. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. So I'm actually working on on two books right now, uh, and one of them is the more pressing one. It's actually gonna be out next year and it's a companion volume to Born to Run. And this, this might be actually be a really great answer uh, to your question, which is that 
it, it, it just suddenly dawned on me that I keep getting the same messages over and over again for, for over 10 years, you know, uh, dozens of messages almost on a daily basis asking me for advice how to run, what shoes should I wear, how should I change, what should I do about my plantar fasciitis, what should I eat, constant. Mm. And I, I never answer them because I'm, I'm not the guy, you know, I'm not a coach. Um, I'm a guy who writes about the guys, but I don't have the information. But it finally, like, belatedly penetrated my head that if people have been asking the same questions for 10 years, maybe you should answer. And rather than me answering, let's go back to the guys who know. So I went back to Eric Horton, who trained me. And we decided to do a companion volume to Born to Run, which is a, a training guide, you know, a, a how to change your running form guide how to run it in a healthy manner. Mm. And so originally I conceived of it as a very sort of bare bones, do these exercises, do these drills, eat these foods, uh, and do this training thing. But as we began to recruit people, I started to interview them, like Lucy Bartholomew, you know, in Australia, yeah. speaking yeah. to her. Um, when you start to talk to people, uh, there's a woman named uh, Jordan Marie Daniel, who's a Native American runner in California. Yeah, yeah. I had on the podcast. Oh, did you? Yeah, she yeah. Is, sensational person running with horses she could yeah yeah or yeah. brings brings three horses brings three horses yeah yeah so wow you got everybody so when i start to i go to these people think i'm going to ask a very specific question but then the story unfolds so this book which i thought was going to be very how to is is evolved into a very character driven colorful narrative book as well uh, and i think that's basically the answer is when people tell you a story, listen, you know, and do what you can to actually uh, include it on the page. And what are you going to? Oh, oh, sorry. Go no, you go ahead, Eddie. I was going to say, don't you think that there is a, a danger by having the fact that, you know, a lot of these stories about ultra running and a lot of these stories about, you know, um, ultra, it's, you know, pulling together all these kind of like big characters, really interesting characters. And it gives um, people on the outside world, well, outside ultra running, the impression that most ultra runners are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's a real shock to them to find out that most, <laughs> most ultra runners aren't, and they're probably the most boring human beings that they've ever seen in their entire life. And so, we're talking about you, listener, specifically <laughs> you. <laughs> you think from some like the incredible stories that, you know, that you, it, obviously in your book, in, you know, uh, like you know Dean Canaz's book and and, and mm. other ones like it that, that you've got all these like crazy characters and things like that and then the reality is when you go to an ultra that it's just that, where are all those people <laughs> maybe it's different in America <laughs> is that what you find though I mean well, <laughs> I have to think about that because uh... I'm just attacking I'm just attacking our listener base really that's the that's <laughs> Yeah, you know, it is actually one step. If ultra marathoners are boring, imagine the people who are then listening for two I know, hours. listening to a podcast. <laughs> well, that is, that is. So not only are we dissing our listener, you're now dissing our listener. <laughs> now look uh, in the mirror, listener. Look, diss yourself. You're exactly. the only one left who respects you. <laughs> Ask yourself some hard questions. <laughs> I, I got to say, I don't know. Um, I, I find them pretty fascinating, you know. Uh, I think maybe maybe it's like sort of um, you know buyer's bias or something, but the people I seek out to talk to maybe are, are just happen to be the ones who are interesting. But you know, I was at UTMB to crew for a buddy of mine uh, the year before the pandemic, and I had a I had a ball, man. I had such a good time. Like everyone was so juiced and jazz. Have you have you guys been there for UTMB? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've not. Oh man, Chamonix is just like. The, the love fest, you know, everyone's so excited, and like Hillary Allen walks down the street, people like lose their minds, you know, and, <laughs> and it, it makes it all seem so exciting. And I just hung out with this woman. Oh, dude, I heard the best DNF story that's ever been told. So I was hanging out with this woman from San Francisco because her husband was kind of running the same pace as my buddy. So she and I were going to be crewing together. So we're hanging out in some Italian village at like four o'clock in the morning, freezing her asses off. And she's like, I really gotta be on my game because this means so much to my husband. He DNF'd last year. What happened was he had gotten within three miles of the finish line and he went off course. And he was with a French runner and he went off course. And then the French runner realized, whoa, whoa, we're off course. And, but he didn't, this guy didn't speak any, uh, any French. The French runner turns around, 
this guy keeps going. When he finally realized, hey, I'm off course, and the other guy left, he's like, you know what? I'm going to take a beat. I'm going to take a little nap, and then I'm going to a grid, way, you know, grid search my way back on course. So he sat down to a tree, set his alarm for 10 minutes, and went to sleep. Before the 10 minutes go up, the French guy had gotten to an aid station, and he goes, hey, there's some dude down there. He's lost. So they sent rescue workers down to find him, and they find him, they find him passed out under a tree, right? So they call for assistance. He's like, no, no, I'm good. No, no, no. They tie him down. They helicopter him out <laughs> three miles. He goes, we went up, over, and down. And then he says, no, no, I'm fine. They get him to the finish line. He was, like, a little bit dehydrated. He's like, I'm fine. And then, like, and he, at this point, he's still, like, like, eight hours under the cutoff. He's like, can I go back? He's like, no, no. Once you've been in the helicopter, you're out. So no. he, yeah, so he was at, he was out three miles from the finish line with, like, eight hours to go, and he got DNF'd. And it was just That's driving in, insane. Yeah. The, so if he was running with a, a creation runner, he'd have been absolutely fine. <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, his wife, his wife had laminated little cards in French which said, no, I'm fine. No, <laughs> <I'm in laughs> <helicopter. laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, wow. Can you imagine if, has he ever met the French runner again? You'd be so angry. That is going to be like a Liam Neeson movie, you know, like he's out. <laughs> I will find you. <laughs> <laughs> je, je will. <laughs> My French is terrible, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and what's the other what's the other book going to be about? Yeah, so it was a kind of spinoff of um, that uh, that um, female big wave surfers thing. But you know, again, so it was like this revelation to me that that moment I realized I I got to do stories where I can really feel it. And so when um, we moved back to my wife's home in Hawaii, uh, I thought I was like the world's best body surfer. I thought I was like going to be the Hawaiian state champion because. You know, I grew up like kind of like a Brighton Lake area, the Jersey coast, where I thought I knew body surfing, where you kind of just like plank out with your hands in front of you and you just go straight into the sand. Then I get to Hawaii and these guys are doing some crazy ass shit. So there are dudes who body surf in Nazare. Like there are dudes who are body surfing 60 foot waves. And so I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. So I started to get involved in this subculture of body surfing, which to me is perfect because um, it's an anonymous sport that no one cares about. There's no sponsorship. There's no championships. Uh, they just actually held the European championships on the southern coast of England just a couple of weeks ago. Um, maybe like two weeks ago. The UK slash European body surfing championship. God, that would have been freezing. Exactly. Oh, yeah. What a terrible place to hold anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh. That's basically what I'm doing is I've kind of immersed myself into the world of Hawaiian body surfing and see how that goes. And do these, do these communities of, of extreme individuals who, who really are swimming against the tide as such, you know, of, of societal norms, would you, are they all kind of similar? Uh, the individuals, you mean, so. Just, I guess the feel of the, the would, you, would you say there are a lot of similarities between those early ultra runners who are drawn down to uh, Mexico to the the people who for some reason have decided to get a donkey and they're running it and the the, the the body surfers who are doing it for no reward just you know even though it's dangerous extreme like do you think these these are personality types that are just wearing different sports clothes or yeah completely I, I think that's kind of my you know, I, I come across as a as kind of a sourpuss a lot because I really don't like organized sports. I hate the Olympics. I hate big city marathons. I I hate the elements of the sport that are designed for spectacle. Uh, I just really dislike them. What I love is the little things that people are doing in the shadows because they really like it. And they're working just as hard as anybody else, but they're just doing it because it's really cool and it's fun before mm. it's been discovered. And so, yes, that, that totally translates from ultra running to burrow racing to body surfing. Um, you know, there's a game on Orkney called The Bah. You know, every New Year's Day, uh, a bunch of like drunk Scots are beating the shit out of each other in like a city-wide game of rugby. And they do it because it's wicked fun and they're having a good time, but they don't expect to get anything out of it. You know, they're not gonna win any prizes or get any money. And that's what I love because it also, as an outsider, when you show up, 
you're, you're totally embraced. Like people mm. love it because they can't believe like you bothered to show up and, and hang out with them. Have you seen the TV series Home Game? No. Oh, I heard about it, but I haven't seen it. You yeah. should watch it. It's, it's yeah, very yeah. much about those communities. So there's yeah. a, it could be frog jumpers where they've spent 20 years perfecting the technique and breeding the, the, the perfect frog. And these people are convinced they're, you know, incredibly talented in it. It's won by like a 12 year old girl in her first <laughs> year. It's, all, it's, we, it's, but, we are, it's We Are the Champions, it's called. We are it's home game because there's, there's there's two there's home game and we are the champions and we are the champions he's got the cheese rolling in as well yeah, yeah. and the chili eating so let me, yeah. let, me tell you, let me tell you something about burrow racing so there's a girl named Lindsay Doak and I believe she was 14 years old in her first burrow race and right before the race she's a 14 year old girl these are big dangerous animals and you're running up into the mountains which are treacherous trails uh, Lindsay was a very talented runner. She had a good donkey with her, but her parents were very apprehensive. So her mother grabbed a couple of guys who happened to be standing next to Lindsay at the starting line, the, these guys, the Pedretti, the, the Pedretti brothers, and said, would you do me a favor? Will you watch out for my girl? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. These guys are very competitive runners. But when they realized about halfway through the race, like, this girl was good, at one point they go, Lindsay, go, just go. And then she just took off. But what I loved about it was, to me, there wasn't even a heartbeat of hesitation. Two guys who have trained and have competed for years are approached by some anxious mother about their teenage daughter. The if you did this in the beginning of the New York Marathon, they tell you to go pound sand. Wait, yeah. what? I, I trained all year for that. I'm not going to hang out with your teenager. <laughs> These guys didn't hesitate. Of course, we'll watch out for her. Number one, and number two, when they realized that she had an opportunity to, to race, you know, they said, "Go for it, man! Like beat us." And so, to me, that's what I love about those activities where mm -hmm. it's about the culture and the craft and the camaraderie first. Super competitive, but it's not really about beating or winning. It's more about all of us just having a really cool experience. And, and do you get a lot of people emailing you suggesting communities? Oh, not, not so much. Not so much. Um, a lot more from runners who want me to you know about races. Hey, you should cover this race. You should go to this race. And uh, which is kind of cool, um, but I'm really not that interested in the racing. I'm more interested in the mm. happens way before the race. Mm. Well, we're I'm, I'm conscious we've we've had spoken to you for some time. We've got quite a few questions. If it's all right to yeah. have them across to you, I've um, <laughs> they're all spread around the internet. Some of the, some of, some some of them are actually usable. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the ones um, that I remember from a, a different page I've not read yet is, do, do you ever wear any any of the, in fact, it's probably from Kev, I think. Um, do, do you ever wear naughty trainers these days? And would you ever wear the Vaporfly yourself? I love that naughty trainer. That's going to be my thing from now on. <laughs> I, I Some call them traditional shoes. Oh, they're the naughty trainers. Uh, I, I only wear them when my wife's feeling frisky. Um, yeah, um, oh, just to turn her on. Oh, you bad yeah. boy. <laughs> so, no, the reason I don't is because I'm still a big guy, you know, I'm still a big, heavy guy. And I, I live like a kind of like a lapsed alcoholic. I keep feeling like if <laughs> if trainers become too comfortable, it's very easy for me to backslide into really bad form. So I try to go as minimal as possible to always remind myself to, like, you know, stay sharp on form. So um, Yvonne Petch says, how's Sherman doing? Oh, Sherman's doing good, man. He's uh, He and his two buddies, Flower and Matilda, are now living on a 150-acre farm with like a heated barn and a flowing water system. So he's uh, he's, he's living the life of a king. <laughs> so um, I, you may have covered this one, I, but John Richardson's asked, is there anything you'd have changed in the book now in uh, retrospect? Uh, nice born to run? Yeah. No, I, I think I'm, I'm very, very happy with it um, because I wrote it at a time when I was pretty sure I knew what I was talking about, but I wasn't positive. And when you write about people, you know, you write about a Barefoot Ted or a Scott Jorick, you think you know them, but you may not. You know, for all I know, Scott could have a murder buried in his past, you know. And so it's been good to look back now years later and realize, no, the, the science 
the research, it all bears it out. And mm. the people are who, who um, I, I, they are the way I describe them. And actually, this one's from Matt Finn, it's a good one, um, which we probably should have asked ourselves. Why do you think that, given how popular the book's been, that barefoot and minimalist, a minimalist movement hasn't gained great attraction? I think it's because it is easier to buy than to learn. And so, mm. you know, every, nobody, nobody is spending millions of dollars on an advertising campaign to try to break the two hour marathon in bare feet. You know, there's no mm. economic interest in bare feet. Yeah. So no one's promoting it. But what you're seeing all the time is shoes and races, shoes and races, you know, faster and more expensive. And that's why, uh, I, I think minimalism is this craft. It has great rewards, but there's nobody's out there beating the drum saying you should do it. So um, this one's from Sean Dyer, and so I can't remember because his 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 question could be perceived as quite rude. Um, but <laughs> I'll just yeah, I'll put it to you because I think you you you're a grown man and uh, you can rebut it if uh, if you think it's unfair. So how do you feel about the fact that everyone portrayed in the book seems unhappy with his um, speech marks fiction about them. Oh, I don't, I don't know who's unhappy. That's what I wasn't sure of either. Um, I, know, I know Anne Trayson uh, was not happy with her depiction. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate, but uh, I feel it's completely accurate. Um, and otherwise, yeah, you know, uh, I don't know, man, Caballo seemed pretty happy and Scott and Jenny and Billy, so yeah. I don't know. Sometimes there's a lot of sort of scuttle button rumor and conversation that isn't really coming from the people themselves. Yeah, true. Actually, people do get defensive of friends or um, yeah, yeah. Um, I rem sorry, I remembered what the what, the point I was going to make with the with the with what I was talking about before. What I was going to say was, um, do you think that uh, where where do we kind of go from this? Because um, with yeah, the wearing of shoes is so is so deeply ingrained. What what is the what is the path to 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 move people out of it? Should it be educating children and educating our children to 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 to, to stay with their natural form, or or is there another way of doing it? How do we kind of escape the the, the reliance on on the shoe? I I don't have a good answer for you, um, and I've thought about it a lot. But it's a conversation that I feel like I had the same conversation over and over and over again, and mm. uh, I, uh, it never seems to progress. So, all right. people tell me like, "Oh, I, I get it. It's, it's not for me though. Or I really like my shoes." Or like, "What about all the, like the the dog poo and the syringes on the ground?" And, and <laughs> I feel like you need to move syringes <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so that's where I left them. Um, <laughs> so. You know, I, I, one time I was on a radio show and a, a caller called in toward the beginning of the show, like, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't think I could do it. I, I don't think, you know, barefoot running's for me. And I said, what are you doing right now? Uh, nothing. Why don't you just like, go run around the block and then call back in? And the guy's like, okay. So he hung up the phone and then we continued the radio show. And like 20 minutes later, the same caller called back in. He's like, oh, that worked out great. And like, well, why didn't you try it first? But there is a sense that like people are unsure, mm -hmm. they need to learn more, they have to buy something. It, it, the whole concept is so taboo that they just don't realize you can just do it. You know, my wife is pretty good, so she developed her own technique. She took her running shoes in her hand, and then she would run until it was uncomfortable, and then she put her shoes mm -hmm. back on. So the first day it was like a hundred yards, the next day it was like a quarter mile. But whenever she felt anything, you know, a little bit of abrasion or a pebble or a sore calf, she put her shoes back on, finished her run. And to me, like, that's just so perfectly logical. But anyway, so I, I don't know what the answer is because people just seem so resistant and have their defenses so built up and nothing I've ever said really seems to make a difference. So I, I don't know where to go. Because it's with, the ch it's with the children. So I was like, you know, it, 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 it feels a very difficult thing because you're so ingrained with the the old whole idea of their feet needing protected with trainers and things like that that the idea right. of putting putting you know like mm. these like minimalist shoes on them that you know 
their poor little feet are going to get all all damaged and you know i don't know it's really it's it theoretically you can do it and then when it comes to it and then my wife's going of course you need proper trainers don't be ridiculous you're like okay yeah fine that's what it, whatever you say it's it, it's just it's just like the practicality of doing it and, and and knowing how to do it and um you, you know just trying to not go too far down the route of um you know just ending up in the same position that everyone and you know everyone of our generation ended up you know wearing um you know hugely cushioned shoes that that, that caused all, all kinds of injuries yeah i mean it's funny because i think the first argument that most parents have with their kids is telling them to put their shoes on like kids don't want to wear them <laughs> yeah exactly that's true how, how many times has like your kid come inside like well, where's your other shoe like why do you have one shoe um the kids don't want the shoes we force them to put them on the kids are fine if you let the kid bust out the door and run around barefoot they're perfectly happy and they don't need to be told hey don't run on the glass they, they figure it out pretty quick like, oh the sharp shit better not walk on it so again we, we force them to do it this is not their choice uh, but again I don't, I don't know what the sort of socially adjusting mechanism is to make it to make it uh, better uh, vivo barefoot has put a lot of effort into it they make a lot of kids shoes uh, they promote them pretty aggressively they're very um, market savvy company so they're, they're they're ones that are actually trying to uh, aggressively you know fight fire with fire by advertising the same way that um, naughty trainer companies do too so but i, I don't know, I don't know what, what, how it takes hold, you know, it's just too easy to put out a shiny product every six months and tell people they, they ought to buy it. Hmm. And and is it annoying sometimes that, you know, even today you're talking about this issue that you probably before the book came out, didn't expect it was going to be so defining for for your your hit, your life, really? Yeah, no, it's not it's cool. I mean, the fact that, listen, man, anybody who's paying attention, Every day, that's 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 a godsend. You know, the fact that people are reading the book and want to talk about it, right on, right on. I think my um, frustration is with myself because I don't feel like I've gotten good at articulating an answer that works. And so that's it. You know, sometimes when you're in an argument, you realize it's not that person's fault. I'm just not doing a good job of explaining it. Because if I were, mm. this person is smart. They would get it. I'm just fallen short of the right words. Mm. And actually going back to what we were saying last time about the last point, and, and also your wife's, um, her approach, I think that's part of the, the problem is that people like to be given a very strict and rigid set of instructions that they can follow. And if it doesn't work, they can then blame someone else, as opposed to just being told, well, just go and run a bit. And then when it gets a bit painful, stop and then listen to your body and then you know adapt slowly and just adapt in your own time it's and too nuanced too nuanced that isn't it for, yeah for, for yeah. most people to be to be, to be, uh, to be more charitable i think the difficulty is that we've allowed very little time in our daily lives for recreation and exercise and so mm -hmm. if i'm telling you hey tomorrow instead of doing the 45 minute run which you really enjoy um you're just going to do a 10 minute run you know it's it's really kind of taking some fun out of your life. So, and you've only allowed yourself 45 minutes for that fun. Plus there's a race you really want to do with your friends in six months. So mm. it's not always that people are being lazy or um, simplistic. It's that they're being asked to do something that isn't really what they want to do. They really want to go out and have a good mm. time, and get a sweat going and get their heart rate up and continue training. So you're being forced into a choice of either, either I can train or I can learn this skill. And that's the difficulty. Well, because because when I switched from midsole to forefoot runner, I actually did something kind of similar to your wife's approach, where I never stopped to reduce. I didn't reduce my mileage at any point. I was running 50 miles a week for 60 miles a week previously, and I just slowly changed the percentage of miles I was running mid midfoot slapping to forefoot running, um, and it gradual transition but by the end i was then running everything forward so it, it certainly is possible to to have it all as such um now last question i think this one's from becky millington and you might not know the answer but just in case you do um how does the foot change during the process of transitioning to barefoot and minimalism 
And the reason why she's asking, she's saying, is that anecdotally, some people say that their feet barely change. Others say they grow longer. Others say they get shorter. Yeah, again, it's only on the strength of anecdote. I've heard the gamut. I've heard people with flat feet say their arches came up. I've mm. heard people say, yeah, their, their foot actually sort of contracted. My personal experience is I think um, that I become less tolerant of a more narrow shoe. So it's not like my foot has gotten bigger. It's just become mm. more stiff. So I think I went from a size 12 to a 14. I was probably always a 14. But I just wore a 12 because I thought that's the way it was supposed to feel. Uh, one thing that Galahad Clark does a lot. Uh, have you guys met Galahad? No, I don't think so. Oh, yeah. You should get him on the podcast. Holy shit. This guy is a trip. He's the guy that created Vivo Barefoot. And um, he is both super charming. He's, I believe, what you would call like a lout. You know, he's like a, a drinker, a partier, but an idealist, um, funny as hell. <laughs> and he, he's he's terrific. He's terrific. Uh, but you know, even for instance, when I, when I met him in the early days of Born to Run, when they were just starting Vivo Barefoot, and I showed up for a, a lunch with him, and I ran to the lunch. I had a little backpack, and he saw the backpack, and he saw that I was running. He's like, "That's it, no more taxis for me." And like that was it. He would <laughs> around London again. He just ran everywhere. So, but the reason I bring him up is because he'll do something. Like, he'll be talking to somebody, and he'll say, take off your shoe, take off your shoe. And then he'll examine their toes to check out the, the gap between their toes. And they'll like, yeah, see you? Yeah, that, that's your problem right there. Your toes are too close together. And so to him, it's like you can tell if someone's foot has adapted to barefoot running, whether their, their toes have started to splay. <laughs> My left foot has adapted. My right foot hasn't. It appears. <laughs> it appears. <laughs> yeah. Well... Um, well, I think I've covered off the questions that I can see in front of me. Have you got any more on your side, JD? No, I, the, the ones I was looking at, we pretty much we pretty much covered. Um, and there's just general stupid comments that are not worth um, worth talking about that we'd expect from our audience as well. I don't mind. Um, I don't mind a stupid comment. You, know, throw, you can throw a stupid one at me. Some of, some of Dave's weren't all that great. <laughs> the whole way through. <laughs> Obviously, you have listened to other interviews, I've done. <laughs> if people want to follow you and your future journalism, journalistic career, what, what's the best way for them to do that? So, um, yeah, my website's chrismcdougall.com, but right now we have some really cool little videos on uh, Instagram. Uh, I think it's Chris McDougall author is my, is my thing there. But we did this photo shoot in California for the new book, and we made a little, like, three-minute video. And I keep watching it over and over again because I feel like it's so cool and so fun. So... They go on Instagram and check out those little videos. I think they'll, they'll have some fun. Yeah, I actually watched that earlier today. And that, uh, I, yeah, I was like, all right, he's doing a companion piece. What's the companion piece going to be called? That's actually a point of contention. I, I want to call it, you know, Born to Run, the ultimate training guide. Mm. Uh, but my publishers are kind of pushing back. Uh, they think that's a bad idea. So um, we'll, we'll see. Something like that. I'm, I've just been calling it Born to Run too, And then uh, I figure I'll just keep calling it that and maybe – Maybe we'll just do it without remembering why they're not. We're not supposed to. <laughs> Surely it's like born to run. So you've got yeah, a, a digit ah, in the middle. Good. That's good. Like Thanks. a big two, right? Yeah. Born yeah. two. I've been calling it B R. Hang on, where are they going? B two R two. Yeah, B two R two is what I've been calling it. But the fact that I can't remember it may not be the best advertising. <laughs> Well, if you want us to put it out to the podcast and see what ideas they come up with, out of the the thousand no. piss take, one of them <laughs> no, might actually be quite good. <laughs> not worth it. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming to the podcast. When you finish your next book, do let us know because we'd love to have you back on. And, oh, yeah. You know, if you ever make it to the UK, let me know because I'm here for a beer and a beer for a run. You know, I'm actually going to definitely be there next year for the Body Surfing Championship. So, you know, a year from now, I will be there. Yeah. Brilliant. And Jody lives on the South Coast, so he's happy to enter. <laughs> That's not true. And I don't imagine it's going to be on the South. I imagine it's going to be uh, like Torquay or somewhere like that, isn't it? <laughs> hey, hang on. I, I got to look this up. Do you guys have one second? Let me just look it up right now because it was just. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was just. <laughs> I'm just happy to enter. <laughs> hang on.
And boys. maybe JD can can bring his pony along as well, so you can go for a run. You can do like a, a weird triathlon. It's like a triathlon, yeah. Like <laughs> pony oh, you guys are making pony. a mockery out of this. Hang on a second. How was <laughs> Bamboo UK body surfing? Uh, uh, Fistral Beach, Nuque. Oh, Nuki. Nuki, yeah. yeah. Oh, Nuki, wow, that's that's, that's cool. south south. Um, but well, if you, you'll you'll be flying in through London, I assume. So make sure <laughs> make sure you let me know. And if I am free around that time, maybe we'll pop down as well and do a bit of body surfing. I love your response to official beaches. Like, yeah, no, you have to come through London. I ain't going down. <laughs> yeah, there. no, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't leave London. He doesn't. He, he doesn't go outside of London. The only way he gets outside of London is if his mate Ross drives him outside of London somewhere. If Ross, if Ross is going to Newquay, he'll see you. If he's not, no. And, he'll and see he you might do. He, he lives down there, so there is a chance no, that he's he going home for Christmas. Yeah. Um, Brilliant. Well, thanks so much, Christopher, and we'll we'll hear you next time. You've got the book out. All right, guys. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much. That was a lot of fun. Awesome. That was great. Cheers. All right, guys. Cool. We'll, um, right. It'll, it'll probably be three, four weeks before we put it out or so, but I'll let you know. And yeah. um, when when the new book's out, we're more than happy to post links, all of that in the Facebook group or, you know, anything that, that helps it, talk about it on the potty. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's let's stay in touch. I'll make sure you guys get an advanced copy. Um, so, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we'll it's gonna come out a year from now, like next October. So um, we should have copies available by next summer. But I'd be really curious to get your reactions to it. And there's there's also a few people in the UK who like Vic Owen, so we know are pretty big on the barefoot running scene. Yeah. Who is it's we can connect you with who I'm sure would be happy to promote, happy to almost be your sales reps on the ground because they're so passionate about it that yeah. th this is almost the tool that they need to try and help the yeah, people it's who like are kind they, of key. They, they need, they're the Jehovah's Witnesses and they need a copy of Watchtower and this is it. You've got yeah. it. <laughs> you put it in yeah. hand. <laughs> I like that too. The Watchtower for Barefoot Runners. That's going to be thrust, thrust into someone's face and persuade them. Because everyone wants to be compared to Joe the Balance. You're not trying hard enough. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks again, Christopher, and uh, we'll see you next next autumn for sure. All right. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Take care. See you later. Bye. Oh, <laughs> I, as soon as as soon as he replied, I thought this guy's going to be a great guest. So I don't. It's funny. What, like, why haven't we got him on sooner? It's one of those ones you just like. What? It's like it seems to be like a massive omission. Like, yeah, doesn't it? Like, how how have we gone? About like, three hundred and twenty episodes, and oh, it's like, oh, wait a minute, the guy that wrote the book, like the biggest running book of all time, he might be someone that would be worth getting on the podcast. It's yeah, and it's it's strange because it it probably hasn't. There would have been a time when we didn't think we could get him. Yeah, and then it's just never come back into our into our thinking. So it's, 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 same with Jim Wormsley. Like, why would we have Jim Wormsley on? One of the best ultra runners of all time. And like, just emailed him like, Jim, sorry, forgot to say you should come on. He's like, cool. So he's going to come up soon. But um, I emailed Christopher, and within within a day, because normally. It can take up to like a year and a half for someone to respond. <laughs> yeah. Depending who they are, he just went. It's about time you guys are fooling around with the gold medalists and world champions when I've got donkeys. Get me on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's really, that was his response. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and and every in we we whenever we put the posts out, whenever I've mentioned it, people are really excited about not just the fact he's the author of this book, but actually I think they're quite excited to hear him because he's cl he's clearly such a personality. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, the, the It's really interesting, the conversation we're having about personalities. And I, <laughs> I am kind of like half joking, you know, about the fact that you get this impression that, you know, that there are a lot of personalities. Of course, there's a lot of personalities <laughs> and stuff like that i was just i was, I was bit i was trying to be funny um but, but the, the, do you know what when we were talking about it it was exact i was thinking exactly the same thing as you i was thinking cheese rolling i was thinking mm. like this is like he's talking about these pockets of communities and i was thinking cheese rolling and i couldn't remember the name of the thing and then you said oh home game like yeah it's it's the, yeah, it's those two it's just you're absolutely right it's like finding those communities that you hook something on 
um, and you turn it into a story that then you know, becomes something bigger. And it's it's yeah, and it, it needs to be that that size event because you always need that fanaticism without the payoff because it's perfectly understand it and it's understandable that someone would train incredibly hard to get a gold medal in 100 meters because the rewards are so huge and so actually you're probably not going to find anyone that unusual or colorful a personality because actually they're just going to be someone who's very driven very focused who trains incredibly hard it's the most boring story it's yeah. someone incredibly talented trains really hard and wins something yeah and so it's it's the people that are, are doing extreme things for no reason that well for no ex, no perceived external reason that are that are the interesting people because they've got this desire from something else and that something else is what the story is yeah absolutely um no i thought that was really i thought that, i thought that was really interesting um I, I, there's something else that i, I keep and, forgetting and that, stuff that follow-up <laughs> book will be great because it, it really is needed a, a good accompaniment yeah. for understanding all those details because quite a few of the comments and the the questions that we didn't read out that we partly covered were to do with the fact that really when you think i can't think of any other phenomenon that has happened because of one book in any any walk of life really but also in running nothing has changed nothing has been big in in the changing of thought process ever other than this book and it, it does feel as if it, it was going to be this tidal wave that came in and then because of the early adopting being crashed being, up against the rocks of physiotherapy and, yeah uh, that's it yeah. That, that's it isn't it? It, it, it there was so many injuries that's what that's what i was saying i think it it kind of the adoption of barefoot was harmed by almost the popularity of it and the fact that it it, it was that just that jump into it very yeah. very quick you know without any kind of knowledge and the challenge will be how do you how do you restart the revolution gradually gradually <laughs> gradually yeah. with as minimal it's called minimalist for a reason minimalist effort <laughs> but no it's true but that's the thing it kind of did need the um it, i think it's like that with a lot of books isn't it it's like mm. you, you, even like something like ultra marathon man when you when you read that you're like fuck it i'm gonna go and run fucking 60 miles and eat a yeah. pizza while i'm eating it and they, it, while i'm doing it and do you know what you you can kind of get away with it you can kind of get away with it in a lot of those situations you can kind of do something a bit kind of a bit crazy and and you know and, and push yourself to it because just because someone has told you to do it with the barefoot thing though you, there's no hiding from the fact that your your feet are not prepared for that but i'm, I'm gonna ask a question in the group in the Facebook group to see who's tried barefoot, who's stuck with it, who's just given up because they did, it wasn't for them or they couldn't be asked, and who was injured, just to it's get really, a sense. Yeah, as to where where people are. The mm. the other thing I I think that it almost happened at the same time and it was really weird is that, um, and I didn't bring this up because I I I I didn't know whether this we could answer this or anything, but mm. um. About the same time that Born to Run came out and um, the, like, the first wave of minimalist shoes came out, that's when hawkers appeared in the UK. And it's almost as though we kind of had like the two extremes. Like at the same time you had like <laughs> yeah. the thing, you also had the super Silks. chunky. So you go to a race and there'll be someone in Vibrams and then I'd be there in a pair of hawkers. And you're just like, what is going on? I like a foot difference between the and, two exactly, people. No, no, no. See, and, and so you're like, what, what, it's really weird how there isn't a kind of a tendency towards a norm. Mm. There is a, 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 just going complete extremes in a, in either direction. Um, and why that is, you know, it, it's difficult to know. It, it, mm. Obviously one, one isn't a reaction to the other, but, but it's really interesting that, you know, those, those, those are the directions that it's summer gone and minimalist, you know, it, absolutely. Everyone jumps on the bandwagon, mm. but you know how much of that has you know. I I I think you know that that's the thing, isn't it? It's 
now is its time actually now is its time yeah it's kind of it, it, it feels like it's a more organic way that it's kind of a groundswell rather than everyone jumping into it and you feel like people are going to pull back from it again. and with the cost of vapor flies we almost need it to be the time now because we can't <laughs> afford the number of trainers that we need so we just have one pair of thousand pound trainers and then the rest are barefoot so it's, we can we can use the same budget to go further but i desperately need the toilet so i'm going to push for us push for an end the long episode but i think it was totally worth it because all three of those books and I, I i actually didn't know the story of the um of running uh, sorry of um, natural born heroes and actually that, that book sounds incredible so um go out and buy them people let us know what you think and if there's any guests you'd like us to interview in the future then do um, get in touch with me, David at Bad Boy Running, or message on Instagram. If you like this episode, then other good episodes to listen to. We, what... did, we, we did a whole episode on barefoot running where we don't know anything about barefoot <laughs> running, but we just generally thought we gave our, our ideas. I don't, I'm not sure that's a good idea to point people to that one, though. I was going to say we did a great one with Vic Owens, but we didn't. We spoke to her at the run show, we, and we, we haven't got that. So... Um, other good authors who 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 are colourful authors we'd had on. I mean, I, I, if you want someone who's actually very very knowledgeable, Alex um, Alex's surname from Outdoor Magazine, who Alex Hutchinson speaks oh, about yeah. Endure, um, brilliant author. Um, that is very worth a listen because he backs up everything with huge amounts of knowledge and, and scientific study and vigour. Um, mm -hmm. A Darren and Finn, we've got um, you know him talking about his books um, and the um, the joys of being an author. So that's a that's a good episode as well to listen to. And a book that's just coming out, just come out. Rob Pope, who was he he ran across America five times. Incredible. Um, you would have seen him around. He is. Um, I can't believe I can't remember name the name the character. Um, <laughs> Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. There we go. His his episode is incredible because he's just so fun, so lovely, and actually because you get some pretty good stories running across America, you get far better ones if you do it five times. And the the Canadian runner, who was that? Do you remember who that was? Um, who was incredible that the author was so compelled to research and write about him because his story was so amazing. Ultra runner in the kind of seventies, eighties. He ran across the whole of Canada to run to a 100 mile race, which he, a 24 hour race, which he won and then ran home again. I've no idea what his name is, though. <laughs> it was about <laughs> three quarters of a year ago. So go look it up. And if you find it, you'll love it. But thanks for listening, guys. Um, if you could review us, that would be amazing. Leave us five stars. The any, especially if you're from a country that is in the UK, it really, really helps with our visibility and attracting guests. Because if you've got a guest who's not from England, when they look at an iTunes rating, they just see the ratings from their own country. So we might be showing up as having zero ratings or having only one or two, and it, it really helps to have a large number of reviews to get that credibility with them that we're. A podcast worth coming on so please do leave it as a review if you want to join the facebook group head over to facebook type in bad boy running podcast ask three questions and we will we might we might let you in um i just like to point out that bob marley is not 90s reggae right so one of the questions is favorite 90s <laughs> reggae. bob marley is not 90s reggae so to put it, it happens a lot and it shouldn't it's just not a correct answer you will not be allowed in if you put bob marley um if you want to buy some merch head over to store.badboyrunning.com we have plenty of merch on there plenty of merch although you cannot buy a mug um we'll uh i'll post in the uh, join the facebook group and I'll post in the facebook group exactly how to get your hands on an official bbr mug amazing well thanks Justin, guys and we'll see you next time see you later